dirt roads to rock crawling, two buck chuck to screaming eagle, moonshine to 50 year old single malt. We talk about it all here on Wheelin' Wine and Whiskey with your hosts, Jason and Chris. Welcome to Wheeling Wine and Whiskey, episode 48. 48. How many weeks are there in the year, Chris? 52. Holy smokes, we're coming up on a year. We have done at least once. Did we do any doubles? Did we double up at all? Mm, yeah, we did double up once, yeah, I, think. I think. we had, yeah. Anyways, we're coming up close to a year. 48, Chris. Welcome to the uh, home studio. Yeah. Uh, sheltered in place. How you doing? With Lorenzo. I'm doing uh, fantastic because I'm drinking right now. Got Sweet. my Jack and Coke right now. That's what we do. This is Wheeling Wine and Whiskey. So Lorenzo's here. I'm here. You're here. That's about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's it. We're uh, social distancing more than our six feet. And uh, we've got uh, uh, all the the... What do I want to say? Sanitizer. You know, all the distilleries have switched over to sanitizer. How cool yeah, is that? Yeah, that is. That's that's making hand sanitizer. So I know uh, Old Trestle up in Truckee mm-hmm. is doing it. Uh, dry diggings that dry we talked about before right. down there, and yep. uh, well, I should say up there in uh, El Dorado um, Hills there off of Highway Fifty. Um, and then I, I've seen online just uh, all these different distilleries jumping yeah. in. Well, people are making it happen because the panic. Uh, you know, not being able to go to the store and basically buy things that are constantly out of stock. You know, it's, yeah. Uh, people are everybody. We're, that's one of the things that's great about America is we saw we we have a problem. We figure out a way to solve it. You know that it is it's pretty innovative. And then, and then Ford. Did you hear where Ford's making ventilators? Yeah, I heard about that. No, I don't hear no Dodge ventilator. You know that wouldn't be good because they probably would. <laughs> we just got basically F one fifty air boxes being. Wrapped around people's heads with a filter, I guess. I don't know. Hey, whatever. If it's saving lives, <laughs> Ford's involved. That's a great thing. Um, yeah, it's crazy times. Crazy freaking times. Keeping it upbeat, though, here. We're uh, we're keeping this thing rolling. Yes, sir. As we uh, said we would, we've uh, been getting a lot of DMs on, on the gram, uh, you know, saying, hey, thanks for... For putting out the episodes and yeah. not shutting down like everything else is shut down, and uh, and I think it's more important than ever that uh, we keep. Uh, there's there's some people that actually want to hear us every Tuesday morning. I know. I, I, I don't know what's up with that. If we're late with the the podcast drop, we get we get angry hate mail. Where's <laughs> and then I just send them over to Lorenzo. Let him deal with it. Lorenzo is always such an ass about it. Though. He is. He is. He can be such an ass. <laughs> So, um, one of the other cool things that's been happening out of this, uh, this pandemic, um, issue situation, um, it's the, uh, the social media and, um, zoom. Oh yeah. You know, these people doing these virtual cocktail hours and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I know, uh, Tyler's club, the Mad Hatters, um, they did their, their club meeting. Yeah, last week. Uh, a couple weeks ago, yeah, a few weeks ago with uh, just, um, you know, through Zoom. Right. And there's no physical meeting, uh, and and uh, the meeting was adjourned, and then it turned into a cocktail hour. Perfect. So it was a lot of fun, and so they did it again here uh, recently. Uh, just just had a, a wellness check, they called it, and it was cocktail hour. Uh-huh. And a lot of fun. So, and I know uh, some of uh, our family and friends have been doing that with their, you know, people they haven't been able to see here in four weeks. Yeah. And uh, so people are getting real creative and using the modern technology to their advantage. Um, and then uh, Old Elk has been uh, doing this uh, on the bar series. Yeah. Uh, which is cool. So, you know, bartenders are out of work. Right, they sure uh, are. You know, they're not doing to go <laughs> <laughs> stuff. So, uh, um, so they've been featuring uh, bartenders, and um, it's it's pretty cool. So they they make up a couple drinks, and uh, of course, using old elk. And I learned a new one called the Gold Rush. Oh, okay. And I had to try it, and uh, it was damn good. Tell me about it. Well, it's a couple ounces of. Uh, you know, old elk bourbon, uh-huh. and then uh, an ounce of um, honey syrup, 
And how do you, where do you buy honey syrup? How do you make honey syrup? Super simple. You ever make simple syrup? Yeah. Which is what's used in an old fashioned. So this is a twist on an old fashioned. So equal parts sugar and water. Right. Bring it to a boil, let it cool. There you go. Right. There's your simple sugar. Well, same thing with honey. Equal parts of honey and water. And water. And Eat boil it. it mm-hmm. And then let it cool. And then there's your, your honey syrup. And then um, lemon juice. Okay. Take like half a lemon and uh, squeeze it in and uh, give that a little stir. And uh, there you go. There's your gold rush right there. And it's a, I can, this is going to be a good summertime. Rock or no rock? Oh, I put it right out. Yeah, you got to have the rock. Okay. It's all about the rock. I got to try that. The big whiskey ball. Yeah, no, I got Yeah. Those. So, um, and especially if you got the old elk, you know, with the mountains and everything, uh, whiskey ball, that'd be nice. So it's called the gold rush. It's called the gold rush. That's perfect for us. Well, that's what I thought. I, I'm going to make one when I get home. Oh, wait, I don't have any old elk. <laughs> you're out of old elk? All I've got is a single barrel. And your local uh, purveyor's out? I may have to stop by on my way home and see, but... Uh, you should hit up a, a BevMo or something yeah, and maybe. see. I know they, last week the ones in uh, Pleasanton had stock, but maybe I'll swing through I know there. the uh, total wine by me uh, is, is out still so so i i gotta i gotta get a hold of old elk here we gotta get more supplies no no doubt it's getting scary so this 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 thing that old elk is doing do they have like a virtual tip jar they do yeah so that's pretty cool so um they um like this 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 bartender here kevin ott um he had um gave out his venmo account oh uh uh-huh you know and people could could throw a tip his way which was pretty cool and then old elk was throwing in uh, 150 bucks matching up to 150 bucks or something so very cool yeah uh, nice nice uh, nod to the bartenders and stuff and and again something to pass the time and and learn something learn how to make some new cocktails learn a new drink uh, from some professionals Instead of he just some drunk guy by the uh, campfire, you know. I don't know any of those. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so some some good uh, stuff going on, you know. People trying to cope. Um, well, it's evolving. So we we've been, uh, you know, we did the interview last week. Yeah. Uh, with Chris from uh, Ultra Four there. All right. Ashton uh, forty eight. Flat black racing? 89. Yeah. So that was cool uh, just to get a, a little Ultra 4 fix. Sure. And uh, another individual here that we've been wanting to interview, and uh, we reached out and said, hey, uh, just I know it's last minute, but are, are you available? Because everybody seems to have time right now. <laughs> Everybody's got time. <laughs> we got all our podcast gear <laughs> set up. We'd love to uh, interview you. And uh, her name's Christina. Yep. The Huntress. The Huntress. Uh, as she goes by on, uh, it's Huntress. Um, That's the name of her Jeep. Well, yeah. So uh, Huntress Off-Road is her uh, gram. That's right. Uh, so check her out there. But anyway, she's uh, a go-getter, um, a foodie, wino, whiskey lover. Nomad. Hunter, fisher, woman. Uh, does some post up some really quality photos on on the gram uh, out enjoying the outdoors. Absolutely. And um, anyways, one of our buddies Rodney was following her, and he says, "Hey, you got to check check this out," you know. And so uh, started following her on the gram, and uh, I was like, "Wow, that's pretty cool." So just she loaded up her Jeep and rooftop tent and started touring the uh, United States. And, uh, yeah, she did that last year. Uh, she skirted by our neck of the woods there in Tahoe, Truckee area. And, um, anyways, I, I was like, man, I got to hear this story. Yeah, for sure. And, uh, so we, we got a, a chance to chat with her. She shared a, uh, you know, some great stories from her adventure. Yep. And, um, I, it was fun. That was a fun interview. It was a really nice, nice time chatting with her. So let's, uh, let's without further ado, let's roll into that one, Chris. No, let's make some more ado. Oh no, I do, <laughs> I do, do you do, do you do the do? Roll them. All right, Chris. We have another exciting guest with us today on the podcast. Yeah, 
And uh, I know you've been following uh, her IG account for a while. I have. Uh, as have I. Our, our buddy Rodney turned us on to it. Um, she's got uh, a killer JKU. Yes, she does. With a uh, rooftop tent and uh, just started exploring. Yep. And home is where she parked it and set up camp that night. And uh, killer uh, photos on the gram. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, capturing this adventure, she's a hunter. She fish. She does, uh, you know, fine dining out there in the middle of the woods, like we like to do. That's right. She likes wine and whiskey. And wine and whiskey, of course, to <laughs> wash everything down. Uh, we've got the huntress Christina with us uh, online right now. How you doing, Christina? Hi guys, I'm great. Thanks so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. Well, yeah, yes, absolutely. this is this is great, and uh, you're you're safe. You're 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 sheltered in place, or, or are you uh, calling some from Iceland or something right now? Where where are you at? <laughs> I am safely sheltered in place at uh, a friend's house in Indiana right now. Very in- exciting. Oh, there you go. <laughs> well, that's probably one of the safer places to be right now. So uh, count. <laughs> I do. I feel I feel very safe out here in the middle of. Uh, nowhere. <laughs> yeah, I, I'll tell you that that's where I would rather be right now. This big city uh, with this virus is not not the best place to be. But uh, we're up in the hills. We're we're safe. You're right. Yeah, okay. we're we're defensible. We've got uh, <laughs> Lorenzo. Lorenzo's on guard for us here. So um, our super producer. Have you met our super producer? You know our uh, who our super producer is, Lorenzo. I don't believe so. No. Oh, yeah, he's kind of mysterious. It, it took people a while to figure out that he's a donkey. He's a little little donkey that we have here. <laughs> we call him an ass. He's but, an ass. Uh, he's our super producer. You'll have to oh, look through some of the him. pictures on the gram to see him. He keeps us in line. Yeah. So, um, anyways, well, let's uh, let's get into this and. Uh, uh, man, I, I guess we start with the with the Jeep. Uh, this isn't your first Jeep, is it? No, no, this is my fifth Jeep. So it's my fourth Wrangler, fifth Jeep overall. I had a Grand Cherokee for a little while that uh, was actually one of the Jeeps I loved the most, to be honest. Uh-huh. I, but <laughs> but that thing was uh, was real hard to get rid of when I finally parted ways with her. But this one is my most capable by far, as far as off road prowess is concerned. It's, well, there you go. Oh, I thought you were going to ask a question. No, oh. no, I'm just sitting here listening. Oh, you and gave me the okay. <laughs> um, so, so you five Jeeps. Um, did you name all of them, or was this the first one that actually got named? Do you name this your vehicles? Is the first one, this is the first one that's officially been named. I think I lovingly referred to my Grand Cherokee as Black Betty for a little while, but that was <laughs> uh, just for just for a little while at the end of her life when she started getting really ornery. So. <laughs> <laughs> which which Grand Cherokee was that? Because I had a ZJ and I had a WJ, and uh, it, was a, it was a 2003 um, Grand Cherokee Limited. So that so, was a WJ. Yeah, yeah. I, I had a 2001, and that was a really really nice vehicle. Oh I, yeah, this I one. It. I mean, other than some, uh, I shouldn't say some, a lot of little things going wrong with it at the very end. Yeah. Uh, was one of the best vehicles I'd ever owned. By the time wow. I finally got rid of it, it was, I want to say, gosh, it had to have been 13 years old by the time I sold it. And uh, it was just in still in really good condition. It was performing beautifully. It was the best vehicle I've ever owned, hands down, in the snow. It was just, I mean, there were so many good things to be said about it, but uh, it was just my daily driver at the time and in and out of the shop for little things here and there. So I finally said I needed something more reliable and I bought a Tahoe like an idiot. And <laughs> that thing was terrible. It oh, was the no. worst vehicle, hands down, I could have ever owned in my entire lifetime. And I've heard other people who had good experiences with them and I I did not. You were not one of them. <laughs> Chevy I was products. Not one of them. Oh, it was no. brand new and in the shop more than my Grand Cherokee was. So I actually traded that Tahoe in for the JKU that I have now um, back in 2017. Okay. Right on. So. <laughs> and your Jeep's a Rubicon model? Mm-mm. Oh, it's, no. a, it's a 2013. Sorry, I was sipping my, my toddy over No, there. that's good. That's good. We <laughs> encourage that. <laughs> it's a 2013 Moab edition. Oh. Which 
yeah, so they just brought back the Moab, I think, for 2019, if I remember correctly. But uh, but the original Moab edition was um, in 2013. Oh, okay. Right. And it was kind of this beautiful cross between the Rubicon and the Sahara as far as, like, the Rubicon's off-road prowess was concerned and the Sahara's kind of luxury package. Right, so right. a really unique vehicle to me when I bought it. Um, and it had, it was already outfitted with a bunch of AEV conversions parts, so front and rear bumper, uh, AEV tire carrier, which all of those things have uh, performed very well for me uh, while off-road. And also, um, I was unfortunately in an accident with it back in 2018. Mm, Nothing, not my fault, nothing I could have controlled, but uh, the front bumper took a direct hit and it, I mean, I drove away, no issues. (laughs) Just just scratched it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The other vehicles were totaled. Yikes. uh, Yep. And my Jeep was... Came out of it just fine. I drove away. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's awesome! So, well, yeah, I mean, we drive these tanks for a reason, right? Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what? Uh, yeah, tell us. Let's get into more details about your Jeep. So, um, you, you stock axles and everything, suspension. What? What have you done to it? Um, any anything else? Sure. So the Moab Edition came stock with a Dana 30 on the front and 44 on the rear. Um, It still has the stock axles. However, I've upgraded the drive shafts. So it's got Adams drive shafts now. And uh, on the uh, for the suspension, it's got a three and a half inch suspension lift. And I've kind of changed around some of the pieces and parts in the lift myself, too. So it's got uh, Fox Reservoir shocks front and rear. Nice. And um, some rock crawler triple rate coil springs that I switched out for that have been probably one of the best suspension mods I did. It rode like it was driving on a cloud after I installed those <laughs> no. compared to what was on it before. So <laughs> triple rate coil springs, you will not regret it. Fair, <laughs> yes, that is that is so true. I drive a YJ. I don't know what that means. Yeah, you're still on leaf springs. <laughs> It was my old well, Jeep. You'll never know what that means. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but enjoy, enjoy that leaf sink spring suspension, and I bet your chiropractor is making a bunch of money. <laughs> oh, if I the, the Jeep, driving the Jeep is the least of my back problems. Yeah. <laughs> so. so, so yeah, so you got a great uh, suspension set up there, and then I know you've outfitted it with uh, with some cool drawers in the back, and uh, of course the uh, the RTT, the rooftop tent. Oh yeah. The tent was, I, I really lucked out on that. I scored a fantastic deal on that tent back at, uh, it was January or something of 2019 when I bought that one. And it was the size that I was looking for. So I have the, uh, the Tapui Autana Sky 3 on um, the Huntress. And okay. it's just like, it's a great size tent if you're really going to be doing a ton of camping in it, like really traveling in it, living in it. Um, it's just spacious enough to sort of bring gear up there with me. If I have to hunker down somewhere cause it's driving rain for days on end, it's got the annex that drops down. the. Oh yeah, yeah. That's cool. Yeah. So it opens up like a whole new living space and, uh, that just the shelter that it provides when you unfold that big tent, just even just the shade from the platform that drops over the side of the Jeep without the annex on it is uh is kind of enough sort of cover and living space to do a couple of things too so right on really it had the space that i needed it was the right price at the time and i love that all the sky panels open up so when the weather is nice and you can just completely open up the top of the tent so you're still you know safely up on top of the jeep and enjoying you know being off the ground but you're wide open to the sky which is awesome oh wow that's cool great view of the stars (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah, love that thing. So that's cool. And then, um, uh, what else? What else you got uh, the, the to organize everything? All your gear in the back. There is so much gear. Oh my gosh! <laughs> you had it laid out in one of the IG photos, and it was like, how does she fit all that in the in the Jeep? <laughs> I know. I wondered that myself the first time when I started pulling everything out of there. I was just like, oh my gosh. But, uh, and I have even more in it now that I'm really sort of living in it full time because that was just for a six week trip the right. first time. And, uh, and now I've sort of committed to this. So, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I do use the drawer system in the back of the Jeep. It's also, there's a platform now, um, over the entire floor of the cargo area that gives it like a little, a little, about two inches of lift so that I can still access 
that sort of cargo area that the JKUs came with. There's like a little, um, almost like a toolbox cut out okay. in the back. In the floor, in, yeah. In some place that you can just stash a few things in. So I have some of my, you know, recovery gear and things like that stashed in there. And then there's a table that slides underneath that platform and fits underneath that. And then the refrigerator I cannot say enough things about that Dometic fridge that I bought. Oh, you got the Dometic. Yeah, those are nice. (laughs) I do. do. It was one of the first things I bought when I realized I was really going to be sort of, you know, doing some significant travel in this thing. And uh, it really has made all the difference in the world. I mean, if you think it's cool traveling with a cooler with ice in it, like a Yeti or something that, you know, lasts five days cold or whatever, like try being able to travel for just weeks on end. Right by ice and not having to, you know, pull soggy bagels out of a cooler or something. <laughs> so yeah. to power so, to power that thing, did you uh, install a second battery or upgrade the electric electricals in the solar. Jeep? Solar? I did not. So this particular Jeep uh, has a 12-volt outlet in the back and an inverter in the front, a 120 inverter in the front. And what I typically do is I power it off of the 12 volt when I'm driving. So it switches over as soon as I turn the Jeep on and start rolling, it switches over to powering from the 12 volt in the rear. And then when I park, it switches back from the 12 volt to um, a goal zero Yeti 400 uh, power station that I have in the back. Yeah, there you go. So that, if I'm not moving, the power station charges off of, uh, it's a set of, folding solar panels, the Nomad 100 solar panels from Goal Zero. Uh, I unfold those over either the hood of the Jeep or I actually have an extension cable so I can put them anywhere that I need to put them wherever there's a sunny spot and it charges over with that when I'm stationary. And honestly, it doesn't even... If I if I don't have sun for a couple of days, that Yeti 400 will actually power the refrigerator for something like two and a half days without having to get charged. Okay, so. that's what I was just going to ask you. How long you could go? I mean that that is that that Goal Zero setup uh, is, is super cool, and then the <laughs> flexibility. I mean that sounds like a lifesaver uh, because oh, it very you, much is. Yeah, because you get out there in the middle of nowhere and set up camp for a few days, and then go to start your Jeep, and your your battery's dead because your refrigerator. <laughs> or drain it. I know yeah. they have shutoffs, you know, to, with low voltage shut off and stuff, but still, Definitely. where you, you totally get to isolate that, that's that's awesome. Oh, yeah. And the other cool thing so, Goal Zero makes um, a charger that you can plug into the 12 volt outlet in the front of the Jeep. So, while you're driving, the power station will actually charge off of your Jeep. There you go. Wow. So, yeah, so I have a lot of different sort of charging options for it while I'm out there. And because I also work while I'm traveling, I have to have, you know, my laptop, my cell phone, my camera batteries, all these other things um, all charged up, you know, while I'm moving, while I'm stationary. I have a tent fan that runs off of the power station whenever I'm, you know, up in there sleeping uh, for the tent run off of the power station at night. So there's a lot of things that are all powering off of that. And uh, it's performed really well for me while I've been on the road. No, that's 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 it right there. I mean, proof is uh, <laughs> experience. And I mean, you're putting it through its paces. And yeah, that just, yeah. That's cool. <laughs> that's awesome. I don't know how I would be able, I, honestly, I wouldn't be able to, uh, to sort of travel the way I'm traveling and still be able to work and do the things that I do. If I didn't have all those all of those things in the Jeep the way that uh, the way that I have them now, so I'm uh, I'm glad that I was able to sort of look at some of the other setups that were on Instagram. I reached out to a lot of the other sort of van lifers and you know sure. off road enthusiasts and overland guys and all this other stuff, and just started before I geared up. I asked people, you know, what's been working for you. I didn't just go off of you know online reviews or anything. I really reached out to people who were using this stuff day to day. And uh, and got some ideas on what was going to work best for me before I started, you know, throwing money around and gearing up the Huntress. But yeah, got some... that I've got so far. Yeah, everything's I've gotten so far has worked out really well. Well, there you go. You you've definitely done your homework, and like you say, getting to talk to the people that actually use it. it I mean, that's like, you know. I mean, it's just like, I want to go out and buy one right now. I, I don't even do uh, the high-end stuff, but, uh, you know, the camper kind of takes care of, we, we glamp. You're going to sell the camper? No, no, no. <laughs> my Jeep's not big enough. I couldn't haul enough gear in my Jeep to be comfortable uh, for more than a few days. <laughs> you and I, you and I, the, the, 
It, I e. I mean, you have to be. You have to be happy living the simple life. That's yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I just I don't know if I could carry enough uh, bourbon and stuff with with me in cases of wine. I don't. I don't know. Uh, It'd be I, tough. I could, yeah, that might be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> when we pulled out of King of the Hammers this past uh, February. We were probably two hundred pounds lighter in just alcohol. Oh and yeah. Numbers. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we were serving all. Everybody else that rolled in and out of King of the Hammers. Yeah. <laughs> Did you you made it down there for a couple of days, or did you? I did you? Didn't. I wish yeah, that I, I did. Um, so I was going to originally, but I had a bunch of stuff going on with the Jeep earlier this year that I was just having to fix a bunch of little things here and there. She wasn't quite ready to roll out yet, so I was uh, I was getting some work done on it. I had some parts that were back ordered and took a while to come in, so it was just setting me back a little bit, and okay. I didn't make. It to, to King of the Hammers. I did fly out to Vegas for a little while, I think right at the tail end of uh, King of the Hammers. Oh, did you? Okay, yeah. <laughs> but uh, but I didn't make it out there, unfortunately. I lived vicariously through all of you guys. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. It was, uh, it's always a blast. Have you been out there before? Uh, I've been out to the area yeah. before. I've not been out there during KOH. Oh, yeah, um, that's I'm definitely, true. I'm not going to miss it this coming year that's for sure yeah, i'm going 100 percent. okay so. yeah it it is uh <laughs> it it is um it's a shit show but in a good way um a lot of fun a lot of fun well, i mean i'm gonna be gearing up with apocalypse outfits like post-apocalyptic outfits now so <laughs> there you go perfect <laughs> I'll, I'll save them for koh <laughs> well, they, yes that might not be too far yeah, from the I truth know. at this point <laughs> <laughs> exactly exactly i need a good excuse to wear them so. there you go exactly. <laughs> exactly so let's let's um uh, or oh, anything else about your jeep um i mean that you want to uh share with our our podcasting fans out here um uh, so let's get into like recovery gear because i mean you're out there by yourself right i mean I most yes. of the time you you might have a passenger that you pick up along the way or whatever your sister or but yep. Yep. i mean you're you know, what kind of recovery gear do you have? And, and, uh, I mean, just even a simple, uh, you know, dirt road and you, you go down oh, yeah. one night to go camp and then it dumps rain all night and that thing oh, yeah. could be slicker than snot to get back out the next day. So, um, I get nervous. There was one night coming out of the Grand Canyon. I was at a, um, I was at a campsite deep in the West Rim of the Grand Canyon and it was, it had been raining for a couple of days and they were telling me at the I had to pay for a trespass permit in an Indian reservation and they were telling me that they were considering shutting down the road because of washouts and all this other stuff that had happened okay. and that I should be careful and obviously you know I took that into consideration decided to go anyway <laughs> <laughs> sure well, so, it's a spice um, of life oh yeah absolutely so I'm like 18 miles down this dirt road and I'm you know no cell phone service no nothing but uh, I do have a, a Garmin inReach Explorer for oh, good, you know, good, real yeah. emergency situations where you know anything that could like potentially happen I do have that for um you know emergency text messages to my parents letting them know I'm alive so. okay do you have a ham radio I don't have a ham radio. I have a UHF VHF um, handheld that has almost no range whatsoever. Right. So I kind of rely on that in reach for a lot of things. That's uh, the ham radio is something I would love to put in the Jeep and actually get my actual ham radio license, which I, would be cool. I, uh, I would highly recommend that. Yeah, it's. Uh, yeah. It, I just did it a couple years ago. Chris and I did, but it it is incredible. Oh um, yeah, and and I mean. It's it's insane the amount of people you can reach and and how good and how clear it is. When you say a couple of years ago, that was 2014. Oh, was it? <laughs> okay, so well, time flies when you're having fun, huh? Oh yeah. So I definitely it, need to look into that. But as far as like actual we, recovery gear, yeah, um, the Jeep has a worn 9,500 pound winch on the front. Okay. So uh, obviously, you need to brush up on your skills when it comes to traveling alone and using those types of recovery equipment by yourself. So I've uh, taken a couple of classes in uh, recovery, which, you know, nothing advanced, Good. just some sort of basic stuff. I'd love to do some of the advanced classes at like Overland Expo or something along sure. those lines. But I also carry some traction boards, um, just the ARB Trex boards. Okay. Or Trex board. uh, I carry a couple of those. And, you know, obviously just common sense, like not 
I use, you know, gut instinct. If right. I look like I'm going to get myself into a sticky situation, I just turn around and I don't even bother because it's just not worth it to me, especially since, you know, this Jeep is, it's not just my daily driver. It's also my home. I was going to say, <laughs> yeah, it's everything. <laughs> it's all of the things. <laughs> so. That's Yeah, that adds a whole nother layer because yeah, it does. I mean, uh, you know, my Jeep, it, it, it comes off a trailer goes on the trail and it's like all i got to do is get it back to the trailer you know and even if it gets (laughs) drugged back to the trailer that's fine just get it on the trailer and i go home but yeah you're this is your home (laughs) yeah exactly exactly so aside from just like you know recovery gear and things like that i also carry just some basic tools and parts and things along those lines good so the box uh, i just bought one of those um rome adventure company uh, cases, which I love. Have you seen those rugged cases from Rome? No. So t- oh, they're what? so cool. So uh, if you go on my Instagram feed and you look at the photos of the front of the Huntress now, there's a huge um, Rome 95 liter rugged case that goes across the rack in the front and it holds spare Jeep parts oh, and, I see it. Yeah, uh, yeah. Tools and all sorts of stuff up there. Um, just things that I didn't want to have to carry around inside the Jeep with me that I didn't need access to all the time, but wanted easy access to in the event I, you know, got myself into trouble somewhere. So, <laughs> Oh, wow. Oh, and then you, oh, yeah. you had to add that uh, step or something in front of your windshield to be able to totally access that conveniently, I did. correct? I did. That uh, thing's so cool. I love that. That's catwalk. a huge box. Yeah. <laughs> Looking at the photo now. Yep. Okay. So, like I said, with the fact that I was really dedicating myself to living out of it, I knew I was going to need a little bit more space and the ability to carry some more gear. So I try to keep it light still. I don't want to weigh down the Jeep too much. The last time I weighed it, um, this was last, I want to say October. I brought it to a truck stop in California, and it was a little over 6,100 pounds when I was out there. Okay. Yeah, I've put a couple more things in it since, so... I'm probably I'm probably rolling around more like 6,500 pounds now, maybe a little less, but... That's not too bad. I mean, yeah, it's heavy, but I mean, (laughs) considering everything that you've got going on there, that's that's good. Yeah. Yeah, obviously, if you get in any off camber situations, you want to keep that uh, weight down low. But uh... exactly. <laughs> so I didn't want to go. Obviously, with the rooftop tent, that already that already added a, a kind of high sure. center. Of but uh, it's actually it's sturdier than you might think. So I've I've you know started getting some experience wheeling around a little bit with the tent on top, and I haven't wheeled anywhere with the case on top of it yet. So it'll be uh-huh. interesting what what the difference feels like when I get out there but uh but just with the tent on top like it is it is a big difference like you you notice quite a bit more sway and you know you start getting really nervous at first but you it, they're surprisingly capable even with the you know high center of gravity from the tent you just have to you have to be careful you have to feel it you just have to know your rig you got to know your rig that's the key that's yeah. we we teach a, a safety clinic um for you know mostly beginners uh, four wheeling. And, uh, that's the big thing that we preach is just know your rig, know your limitations, know what oh. you can do. Know, you know, your rig's more capable than you are most of the time. And until you get it into four wheeling, severe four wheeling for many years. And then it's like, okay. Um, I 100% agree with that statement that your rig is more comfortable than you are, yeah. that you think that it is or anything along those lines, because I'll tell you what, she has surprised me over and over again. So. It, it is amazing right out of the, you know, the dealership, what, what these new Jeeps can do. Okay. Um, and, and yeah, it, it, the technology, uh, too, that they built into them, but, I mean, it's, and, and Jeep's been, you know, on the forefront for years of, of, like you got that Moab edition, you know, where they, they go out into Moab and talk to people and research and figure out what works, what doesn't work. They've been out on the Rubicon, you know, for the Rubicon editions. And it's like, what would you guys like to see on your rig? So, I mean, they're very capable right off the the showroom floor, which is freaking great. <laughs> Cost a little money, but, uh, you know, it's worth it. Oh and yeah, you're, that's you're, for sure. <laughs> you're, you're getting full use out of yours. I am. And I got a great deal on that Jeep. I'm actually the second owner of, uh, of this Jeep. And I ended up haggling several thousand dollars off of the ask price when I bought it in, uh, 2017. 
Perfect. And for what it's got on it and the capability that it has, I stole that Jeep off the lot. So I'm, I've been really, really happy with this one. Sweet. Cool. And how many miles are on it now? She has 114,000 miles now. Mm-hmm. And how many were on it when you bought it? <laughs> Do you remember? Uh, 40. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow. See? That's cool. So, yeah. Uh, she hit 100,000 miles in Winnemucca, Nevada oh. last year in October. <laughs> I, I have friends that live out in Winnemucca. Oh, really? Yeah. Robert yeah. and Donna? Yeah, Robert and Donna are yeah, in right Winnemucca. Yeah, wow. Yeah, what we, do they do out there, if you don't mind my asking? Uh, they work the mine. <laughs> Oh, there we are then. Yeah, okay. yeah there's the, okay. the big mine there. And so he's still working. She's retired. Um, but anyways, yeah, there uh, met them through four wheeling. And um, yeah, we, we see each other uh, once a year at a, a annual camping trip right out of Truckee there, Meadow Lake. Oh, nice. Yeah. And then um, uh, anyways, yeah, we passed through there on our way to Moab, which uh, should be oh, at yeah. Easter Jeep Safari right now. But yep. uh, Oh, how disappointing is that? Oh, my gosh. Anyways, we'll keep it positive. We'll keep it positive. <laughs> so okay, I, 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 happy stuff. I gotta it. ask about the traction boards. Have you actually used them? I've only, you know, I, I've never actually had to use the traction mats myself. Uh-huh. However, I've definitely been in situations where other people needed to use them. Okay. And the only thing I will say that I do use them for is uh, leveling the Jeep. So when oh, you there you it, go. And yeah, so uh, they've come in handy for that, definitely. So if you're in a, I like to have my tent as level as I possibly yeah, can when I'm sleeping absolutely. in it. So in order to do that, you know, if you got to put a traction board under both rear tires or, you know, both okay. tires or something like that, like I could do that and get, you know, a few inches of lift that way in whatever corner I need it. So they've definitely come in handy for for that type of situation over and over again. But. Right. Perfect. I I mean I see them on on you know all the overlander rigs here are are mall crawlers in uh in the Bay yeah. Area and uh, I'm like man I've never actually seen them used out on the trail. <laughs> I mean I can see in mud and snow where it would help and your situation where you're you're trekking down out in the middle yeah. of nowhere I could see having them and. Um, but at least you're using them for sure as as leveling devices. I like that. (laughs) Oh yeah. And I'd rather have something and not need it than Mm -hmm. need something and have it. So I'm 100% on board with that. Although I did, I wish I had them on the trip last fall because I'll tell you what we were, my sister and I were in the salt flats in Utah, just outside of, um, Bonneville. And uh, there were, because, I mean, what people don't realize about the salt flats is that they're not always dry. No. There's actually quite a, like, quite a few months out of the year where the salt flats are wet and muddy, and it is slicker than you could possibly imagine. It is oh, like I ice bet. there. So there were vehicles stuck all over the salt flats oh, <laughs> when we got out there because people just didn't realize that, you know, it's not – they're not hard-packed, you know, salt flats all the time. Sure. So – we came upon these two guys, two tourists in a rented minivan. Oh, good! That were so stuck, and they were um, they were foreign tourists. There was a total language barrier. They're trying to ask me for help because they see the jeep, and unfortunately, like my winch isn't going to reach. The line's not long enough to get them out of there, uh-huh. and uh, you know, I was not about to go out there. Put and get yourself in danger <laughs> just to get these, you know, two right. guys. out. So, you know, they're trying to ask me for help, trying to ask me for help. They couldn't understand what my sister and I were trying to suggest that they do. I even tried to get the van out of there for them. I even tried driving it myself, and that thing was stucker than stuck. (laughs) These guys were literally throwing their clothes underneath the tires, thinking that, like, balling up all of their clothes would give them traction. And just, like, watching the tires spin their t-shirts and jeans through the mud and like out the back of the van. Oh, they were high centered. It was too much. Yeah. It, was, it was hilarious. Oh, jeez. <laughs> wow. Do you have pictures of that? I, yeah. yeah I, you sh- I should have taken video. I feel yeah. like <laughs> it was so funny, but, um, fun fact, it costs $400 cash minimum Ooh. to have the tow company come and get you unstuck from the Bonneville salt flats. Really? Minimum four hundred dollars, and they only accept cash. And and so Incredible. did the uh, the the foreigners have to pay that, or is that uh, how they yeah, end up getting out? Stuck. Everyone who is stuck out in the salt flats. Oh jeez! Oh my gosh! So, I mean, those guys have quite the business going out there. Well, they, 
delivery company is. <laughs> there, there you go. Well, I know. Maybe a, I'll go move out there. With <laughs> start <laughs> start doing recoveries on the salt flats. I'll do it for $300. Exactly. The Huntress Recovery <laughs> Service. <laughs> Perfect. Still make bank. It'll be great. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah. <laughs> so let's let's get into this this trip that you embarked on last year. Sure. Um, so you you took quite the journey, uh, and that that started in July, early early summer. So the, planning, the planning started in July. Okay. And, um, so I found myself in a position where I had a lot of free time on my hands. Well, there you go. Okay. So my position was eliminated at the company uh, I had been working at for about 10 years. Oh, wow. And I've always found that situations like that seem to be a catalyst for some of the most positive changes in my life. Well said. There you go. So, yeah. So I took it as, you know, kind of a personal challenge to myself to use the time to do something that I'd always wanted to do and didn't have the time to do. And that was see the country. And I used to do a lot of international travel for work when I was uh, when I was with this company. And I'd been, you know, in the past couple of years before this, I had been to places like Dubai and Singapore oh, nice. and, and just, you know, London several times and Ireland. And I'd been um, just in some in some really cool locations. But it was funny because I would talk to some of the locals there and they would find out that I was from the U.S. And, you know, they would start telling me about their their dream vacations in the United States. <laughs> right. Places that they wished that they could go here in the U.S. And I kind of sat back and I was like, you know, I haven't seen enough of my own country. <laughs> and here I am, like these these people all over the world are telling me how much they wish that they, you know, could, could visit the U.S. So I kind of took pieces and parts from a lot of their sort of dream trips. And, uh... I'm big on, like I said, conservation and uh, the outdoors and things like that. And the national parks are very near and dear to my heart. Okay. So um, I decided I wanted to check more national parks off of my list. I had one of those national park uh, passport books that oh, I bought. Right. Yeah. In, oh, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Back in 2016, I bought one of those during the uh, the national park centennial and I just made it a point to put a lot more stickers and stamps and stuff like that in my national parks passport. So I started planning a route based on the parks. And I left New Hampshire back in the middle of September with um, just sort of this plan to start heading southbound down the East Coast. And I went through Shenandoah National Park, down the Blue Ridge Parkway to uh, Great Smoky Mountains National oh, Park. Beautiful Central area. Days. Oh, yeah. It's absolutely gorgeous. I had no idea how awesome Great Smoky Mountains National Park would be, and mm. I loved it. I really loved it. It's just um, very kind of – it's an interesting park in that, you know, on the sort of uh, – at sea level, if you will, um, the – just plant life and you know flora and fauna is completely different than when you get up to into the top of the mountains and uh, it's just absolutely stunning so obviously the reason why they call it you know the great smoky mountains is because of that just fog that's always rolling through and it's just so feels like almost mysterious when you get up there it's got this sort of allure when you're up there in the fog and everything and uh it was just it was really it was really cool magical and it was, Oh, yeah, absolutely. And it was a nice, warm <laughs> September day when I got to Great Smoky Mountains. And but then up there at the top of the mountain, you know, it's cool and foggy. And it just sort of like it was fabulous to experience it with the freedom panels off the Jeep. <laughs> <laughs> so, cruising around like that. It was great. And then uh, so I cut west from Tennessee and started driving the I-40 basically west from Tennessee and just kind of splitting off the I-40 here and there. So I stopped, um, I spent a few nights in Tennessee and then in Arkansas and Oklahoma. And I found just some beautiful kind of campgrounds and overlooks and stuff like that, that, uh, offered free camping opportunities. And my whole plan with this trip was to try to keep it as inexpensive as possible by utilizing, you know, the national park campgrounds, the national forests, BLM lands, things like that. So I, I tried to make it a point to pay for camping okay. as 
as infrequently as I possibly could. Sure, right on. And, uh, yeah, so I downloaded a bunch of apps before I left that were really helpful. Um, iOverlander, Campendium, um, FreeCampsites.net, things like that, that uh, that helped me sort of get around the country in a very affordable way. Wow. Um, and then, you know, I started coming through places like Amarillo, Texas, and into New Mexico, and you start getting into the BLM land areas. And I found some just beautiful BLM campgrounds that were either – free or very, very inexpensive. Like sure. I think one was like three dollars or something. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> yeah. So it was just and some really beautiful um just like vistas and things like that that some of these campgrounds were in. It was just it was awesome. Once I started getting like, further out into uh, into the deserts. And the desert was some experience that I'd never had either. So I've been to places like Arizona um, before for work, but I was in, you know, Scottsdale and sure. Phoenix, things like that. I wasn't, you know, out, exactly. I wasn't out wheeling around the desert with the Jeep. So when I, uh, when I hit New Mexico, it was just a totally different experience and starting to find some trails through there. Cool. And the trails in the Flagstaff Sedona area are just stunning. Wow. <laughs> So I did my first Jeep Badge of Honor trail in Arizona with um, – it was the Schnebly Hill Trail in, from Flagstaff to Sedona. And that was just gorgeous. I met some really cool people along the way, um, along that trail actually. And just got some, you know, some gorgeous views and scenery in there. And then uh, Broken Arrow is also in that area. And that's just sort of a famous trail that is, you know, gorgeous and has great views. and. Sure. Just, you through some really pretty rocky areas. Um, and it's pretty easy. So again, like here I am out there by myself, like I don't want to break down on a rugged trail in the middle of nowhere. So I was trying to keep it, you know, pretty mild as far as the trail conditions were Absolutely. concerned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so I left there and did um, Grand Canyon National Park and, you know, actually went and did the, the touristy thing at first and went to the South Rim and I was like, oh my God, it's way too people here. <laughs> <laughs> way too people-y. <laughs> I, I get out. There's... <laughs> So, uh, so I kind of, I went to the South room for like five minutes, took some photos and was like, all right, peace. <laughs> We're out. Been there, done uh, that. <laughs> uh, yeah. So then I ended up in the West room, uh, the next night and you know, that was one of the greatest nights of my entire life was that camping experience down in down in the West room. Um, I ended up camping on a beach that night and met up with, I was expecting to be totally alone, right? Like completely by myself. Uh, no one else was on this entire road, you know, 18 miles down this gravelly washboard, oh, washed no. out dirt road. And sure enough, there was uh, a bunch of headlamps down on the beach when I finally got down there. And it was, uh, it was getting pretty dark by the time I finally reached the bottom of this road. Um, and it turns out there was something like 20 river rafters that were rafting the Colorado River, and they were getting picked up down at the bottom of this road on that beach oh, the next morning. That's cool. So they were just like living the high life down there, partying it up because it was their last night at the tail end of this 14-day trip down the river. <laughs> and they were making barbecue and mixing cocktails and they saw me roll in and here I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm rolling into a party. Like what is going on? Like I felt, first of all, like I was debating. And then second of all, I'm like, oh my gosh, like, okay, fine. This is going to be this there, kind of thing. There goes know? my peace and quiet. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Here goes my peace and quiet. But then I rolled up and I introduced myself and they were like, oh, you want some barbecue? You want some ribs? We've got mashed potatoes. And like they had made this huge spread. And you know me, I, I love sure. food. Well, <laughs> I'm down with that. That yeah. sounds good. Oh, yeah, it was fantastic. They made some really badass ribs. <laughs> ah, that's cool. <laughs> He's like, what are you drinking? We've got, you know, gin and tonics. We've got sangria. We've got bourbon. I'm like, OK, bourbon. This like, sounds good. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, it was so much fun. So I ended up um, partying with these guys all night long. They had me, they were like, oh, does your Jeep have a sound system? And I'm like, oh, well, as a matter of fact, it does have a pretty bad sound system. So they're like, oh, they got, they're choosing playlists on my phone. And they're like, oh, they're pulling all the doors open, the tailgate open. They're cranking the tunes. 
we're dancing on the beach and they've got the headlights from the Jeep shining up on the walls of the Grand Canyon. Oh, wow. That's Colorado cool. River, like right down on the Colorado River. Wow. And the girls and I from the group, we're all dancing in the light from the headlights. And there's, you know, silhouettes up on the walls of the Grand Canyon of us in front of the headlights. And it was just like one of the most epic nights ever. <laughs> that sounds incredible. That is it incredible. It was so much fun. So I uh, I was sad to see them go the next morning. But uh, you got to party. I actually did get to have a little peace and quiet down there by myself the next morning. So I just kind of, you know, made my coffee, made my breakfast. And then get you know, those solar up. panels uh, set out to charge up that battery from cranking <laughs> the tunes all night. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, it was so fun. So, uh, so yeah, I rolled out of there the next day. And uh, from Arizona, I I went on to Death Valley, which was another one of just my absolute favorite oh, places yeah. that I got to see on that trip, and Alabama Hills, and then I went through Sequoia National Park and oh, Yosemite, yeah. and then up through Lake Tahoe area. I spent a few days just kind of... Now you're in our neck of the running. woods, yeah. Oh, yeah, and uh, you know, doing some maintenance on the Jeep, so by that point, I'd put about 5,000 miles on it already by the time I got to Tahoe, so um, I stayed with a friend there for several days and just kind of got a chance to, you know, do some tightening of bolts and screws and things like that on the Jeep and some uh, oil oil changes and things along those lines, Just just some routine maintenance on that, and then left Tahoe and picked up my sister in Reno, which was just such a cool experience to have her join me. She joined me for, I think it was four or five days okay. out of the trip. So uh, when I picked her up at the airport in Reno, we left for the Bonneville Salt Flats from there and um, just spent a few days enjoying some of those, you know, just very remote kind of cool areas that are places that you don't get to see a lot of things like that. Um, not a lot of people spend time visiting the Bonneville Salt Flats. You know, right. They're driving right by it and take a photo and keep moving. Exactly. Yeah, right. Exactly. So it was cool. There's actually um, there's a lot of BLM land that you can camp in and anywhere around the Salt Flats, which is kind of cool. Uh, windy. So be ready for that. But- yeah. <laughs> But uh, just some really nice places out there. That was the morning. I think you saw the pictures of that on my Instagram feed where we were making margaritas. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's great. Oh, yeah. We made huevos rancheros for breakfast that morning and washed Jeez. it down with margaritas from the salt flats. That's, that's so good. Breakfast of champions. fantastic. Oh, my gosh. Well, they say when in Rome, and they're, you're using salt from uh, the salt flats there. Heck, yeah. Yeah, yep, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, so we left the salt flats, and we went uh, up through the northern part of Utah. We did the Great Salt Lake area, and I don't know if you've ever heard of Antelope Island in the middle of the Great Salt Lake. No, I haven't. What it's, now? What month are we in now? What uh, this? The, uh, the, the very beginning of October at this. Okay, point. yeah. So, so this wow. was several weeks on the road already at this point, and uh, so Antelope Island actually has like the highest concentration of bison per like square mile. There are something like two hundred bison on this little island in the middle of the Great Salt Lake. So, so the island's called there. Antelope Island, and it's got bison on it. It's really bizarre. There are. I saw a couple of antelope, <laughs> <laughs> but it's actually mostly bison. I know, ironic, right? Like I don't really understand. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so we just we did that one day. It was just a cool kind of like offshoot. Um, and, you know, it's just one big, long dirt road that goes all the way around the island. And there's some hiking trails and things like that. Although they caution you against using them because the bison can be pretty aggressive. Ooh, oh, I bet. <laughs> and they're everywhere on that island. So we chose to pretty much stay in the Jeep most of the time. Uh, <laughs> we, we took the freedom panels off again so we could kind of like poke ourselves up through the top of the Jeep and take photos of the bison that way. <laughs> From a safe distance. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Like a much better option. So, uh, so we did that and... Then we left Utah and went through um, kind of that bottom corner of Idaho into Grand Teton National Park oh, and yeah. uh, went to Yosemite. Uh, or sorry, not Yosemite, Yellowstone. Yellowstone. Yellowstone, yeah. Yeah, so I'd never been to Yellowstone before, and she hadn't either. We'd never been to the Tetons. We'd never been to Yellowstone. So, of course, as soon as you start getting into the Grand Tetons, you, you think that you're ready for what you're going to see, and then you're like, oh, my God, this is so... <laughs> It's so incredible. It's so much better than we ever could have imagined. Like, we were blown away by Grand Teton and Yellowstone. And I was just so excited to have her joining me through all of it. Um, It was just, it was awesome to have her there. But also, 
her cooking skills are like second to none. So. Really? Wow. Is she, a, yep. is she a chef by trade? or She is, actually. Um, wow. She is a classically trained pastry chef, actually. Um, but she went to, she graduated from the Culinary Institute of America in New York. So oh, wow. Think like Anthony Bourdain level good. <laughs> Ooh, nice. So you got to meet us out food. here and bring her. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, definitely. So she's whipping up like fresh pasta primavera while we're in this campground in Yellowstone. <laughs> wow. There you go. No MREs yeah. for you. Uh, no, not at all. It was fantastic. We were actually at our campsite we were at in Utah a couple of nights prior. There was a, a kind of older couple there who had given us a bunch of sort of fresh veggies from our garden. They like heard the way we were traveling it out on the road. Maybe they thought I was like too poor to buy myself groceries or something. <laughs> Like oh, this this poor girl living in her jeans. I'll give her some free food or something. Perfect. <laughs> it was kind of funny, but um, but it was just really nice of them. So they gave us um all these amazing like fresh veggies, zucchini and yellow squash and tomatoes. So she whipped up this pasta primavera and Yellowstone, and we sat there. We had a bottle of uh, you know four roses whiskey. There you go. Oh, yum! Yeah, a nice single barrel. Oh my there. gosh! Yeah, so, single uh, barrel. Oh. Yeah, so we were sharing that around the campfire that night after some pasta primavera, just, you know, being super classy girls drinking straight out of the bottle because we didn't want to have to wash more dishes on the road. There you go. Yeah. Keep it simple. <laughs> That's being efficient. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Talking about yeah. Efficiency. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I drove from Yellowstone. We went up to Montana. I actually dropped her off at the airport in Billings. Okay. And she flew home from there. But I um, I hunted, actually, for a week in Montana in the middle of the trip. So I stopped in Broadus, Montana. And I had drawn antelope tags along with my father and my uncle. We had put in as a hunting party that year. Oh. So, yeah. So that cool. was really cool. So I got to take five days off of the the trip and uh, do some antelope hunting out on the ranches out there and it was just a, it was, the weather was gorgeous we uh we were all tagged out by the end of the first day of the hunt the population was booming this past really year. yeah wow. so it was uh it was a quick experience for us but I also got to just, you know, drive around a little bit and see a little bit more of Montana. Went down to South Dakota and the wheeling in the Black Hills in South Dakota. Oh, my gosh. Oh, I've heard great that. things. Oh, there's like something like 400 miles of off-road trails yeah. through wow. the Black Hills. Wow. It's absolutely insane. Just so many cool places to go. But you have to, for wheeling the Black Hills, you have to get a permit um, from, I forget what they're what they're department is called uh -huh. out there you know wildlife department or whatever is called out there but uh but you have to get uh passes for some of those areas but once you get out there you can camp anywhere out there and so that just made the experience even cooler and those trails like i said are just gorgeous and they're all different levels from you know moderate trails to easy trails to really rugged stuff that you're gonna probably want a crawler to get over yeah i've seen some videos of some hardcore rock crawling out there oh yeah oh definitely so i just had no idea how gorgeous it was going to be i'd never been to that area of the country and just to even just get to experience it for a couple of days or a few days was just awesome yeah we got all that uh, oh my gosh so it's, now i mean you're in you're in what kind of late october at this point now I mean, yes, yeah, so weather's starting to turn here quickly. It was. It was starting to get pretty chilly. So Especially this in Montana been... and South yeah. Dakota. I want to say that was like the 16th or 17th of October. Okay. At this point. It had already snowed, so we'd been yeah. getting snow in Montana. And it's actually, it snowed on me, gosh, back when I was in Yosemite National Park in uh, the end of September. I'd been, I'd been getting snowed on for a while. At yeah. This point. <laughs> But, um, but yeah, the weather was definitely turning cooler. Fortunately, like I said, with that tent setup that I have, that, uh, that annex that drops down the side, the passenger yeah, okay. side, I can heat that. So I have a little buddy heater. One oh, of those, those work great, don't yeah. they? Oh my gosh, that thing is so cool. And it's, you know, honestly, for the price, you cannot beat something like no. that. If you have the right setup for it where you can use it safely, and fortunately I do, 
they're worth their weight in gold. Yeah. Oh my god! Yeah, I, so. <laughs> I, I, Chris and I both have them for our campers just to uh, when we're doing deep winter camping. It's great to. Oh, gosh, you yeah. know, just heat things up and it's super efficient and, uh, yeah, it doesn't draw down our battery power. Yeah, um, exactly. You know, yeah. So, and it doesn't make any noise. No. Or like that, so, oh my gosh, just fabulous. But <laughs> uh, I started, I definitely started utilizing that thing God, back in, back when I was in California still, I think. Sure. Um, How did you carry around a big five gallon or 20 pound propane bottle or were you just using the little two pounders? I was just using the little ones, and I think they're actually one pounders. They're not yeah, even two pounders. Yeah, one pounder. But, uh, yeah, they're they're real small. But uh, fun fact: the national park system uh, has a recycling program for those one pound bottles. Okay. So any national park that you are in, outside of the visitor centers, there's like little cages outside I've of those visitor that. centers. They have yeah, in Yosemite. Like you can also get them refilled, actually. Okay. Um, those one pounders are refillable. So I used those. Uh, they definitely made for, you know, more logistical stuff to worry about. I had to carry enough of them that I could sure. you know, keep the tent for the night. I had to figure out when I was going to get to uh, refill them or, you know, if there was a good spot to recycle them coming up. Um, that did make it a little more difficult. I do, since then, I do have uh, an extension hose and plan on getting the five pound. There you go. Yeah. Main tank system for the back of the jeep but i just didn't have it at the time so i was working off of those one pounders and uh yeah it definitely started getting cooler i lucked out with some unseasonably warm weather through south dakota and everything like i said in the middle of october and when i hit the badlands that was just oh my gosh i had no idea what to expect when i got to the badlands and just loved it so much just the experience of being out there and at this point like i've been on the road for i want to say like five weeks or something at this time and it just really felt like i was far into my groove of like figuring out how to travel this way and you know even though i sort of had this planned route of where i was going to go you never like things never work out to plan. So right. like think that you've got a good plan. You don't like it's not, <laughs> it's not going to work out the way you thought it was going to work out. Something's going to come up. You're not going to make it as far as you thought you were going to that night. Like you know, things are going to things are going to happen. And I sort of had made this sort of rule for myself where I wanted to get into all of my campsites with enough time to you know sit down make myself dinner, set up camp in the daylight. I didn't want to roll into places after dark. Sure. So that happened to me a couple of times because it's just, like I said, like you, you just gotta, can't. Yeah, it happens. But, but that was kind of my goal was to always get in there with just enough time to decompress and set up camp in the daylight and, and make myself a good dinner and those kinds of things. So I'd really gotten into that groove by the time I hit the Badlands. And I just felt like I was sort of experiencing a lot of these places like no one else was. Like I heard some guy when I went into the visitor center to, you know, stamp my passport. (laughs) I heard some guy say something like, oh, my gosh, there's nothing here. Like I thought I expected more from a national park. Like there's just nothing to see here. And I'm like, who are you? Like what? (laughs) What? I was like, are you not seeing like some of the most unique geology in our entire country here? Like this. Oh my God. What do you want? Amusement rides or something? It's like Disneyland. Yeah. Exactly. I'm like, oh, come on, man. Like, just appreciate it for what it is. So I feel like I was just like, I was in this place where I was really appreciating every different place that I had gone to for what it was, you know, and uh, and really just sort of absorbing those experiences. So, we, we call those people idiots, by the way. <laughs> Can I use that? That's a yeah, great absolutely. Yeah. Oh my gosh, it's I'm not, it's not patented. So yeah, city okay. <laughs> Wheeling wine and whiskey. Great. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so definitely stealing that. So, uh, just uh, uh, curiosity, if I could just interrupt real quick, was yeah, there sure. any any times that he said you? kind of sometimes it didn't go to according to plan i'm just curious if uh, there were any times where you set up camp and it was you felt kind of like it was sketchy or not safe or or yep. <laughs> if you had ended up someplace you didn't want to be <laughs> you, you kind of skedaddled or what twice that happened to me once in tennessee and once in did you hear banjos <laughs> oh it was there was it was banjo territory in arkansas <laughs> where i stopped I had found this link on, I want to say it was like freecampsites.net, but I had found this one spot. 
And when I rolled, like, I didn't even want to roll down the road to the campsite, like to the, I had GPS locations for each one of these places that I was heading to. Right. And as I'm approaching what was supposed to be the waypoint for this sort of free camping area, I'm like, absolutely. Like, no, I don't even want to drive down this road alone. Like, no, no way. No, sir. I don't think so. Yeah. (laughs) So it was just super super backwoods and you know as a woman also traveling alone like there's some other factors yeah, that sure things so exactly. I, kinda, I looked around at my uh surroundings and just i literally turned the jeep right around in the middle of the road <laughs> yeah your instinct kicked in and go no this ain't this ain't gonna end well <laughs> and that night i ended up in actually one of my favorite sort of spontaneous campsites along the trip. So that night in Arkansas, I ended up at a paid campground because obviously my original plan yeah. hadn't worked out and I was just trying to find like the next closest thing nearby. But it just so happened that it was right next to this gorgeous overlook in Arkansas that just when I woke up the next morning, I had no idea it was there because I'd rolled in in the dark having missed the original camping opportunity. And the views were just stunning. And it was of this sort of river basin and other like farmlands all over Arkansas. Oh, and wow. you're just kind of looking out over all this. And the sun was doing that thing where it comes through the clouds and comes down in like beams, you know, like oh, rain yeah. sure. on the ground. Oh my gosh, it was just gorgeous. I couldn't, I couldn't have made it up. Like it was perfect. So that totally made up for uh, not you know, so, getting a chance to do the camping the way I wanted to do it the night before. Yeah, so it went from banjos to angel singing the exactly, next morning. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. So it definitely, that definitely happened. And then the night in Tennessee, it wasn't like, I didn't feel like I was in danger necessarily. It just didn't feel like the right spot, yeah. if you will. Like I just... I was pretty deep into the woods at that point at the top of this forest road in Tennessee. And it just, the camping areas up there were just, it was hard. Like they, they were really wooded and there wasn't a lot of space for the Jeep and just trying to unfold the tent. Like I was in, you know, some pretty rugged bushes and branches and prickers and all this other stuff. I'm like, yeah, I'm all set. There's ticks. Like I'm out. (laughs) Yeah. We're good. I couldn't build a fire in the spot that I was in. Like there was just not enough room for what I was trying to do. And I just didn't, I had driven past some other kind of camp setups that didn't look like they were camping. You know what I mean? It looked like they'd been living out there for a couple of months at least. Uh So, you know, like uh, tent cities and stuff like that, if you will, in some of these forest, uh, national Mm. forest campsites. Moonshine. Yeah. (laughs) But, um, so I kind of skedaddled out of there and went to, I found another, um, spot further down at the bottom of the road that was a little bit more well-kept. So still like some nice, you know, national forest campsites, sure. some dispersed camping areas, but it just looked like, you know, it had maybe been frequented a few more times and, you know, somebody might hear me scream. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, but think about it. I mean, you you spent what six, seven weeks on the road or something, and, and out of all that that time, you had two or three yeah. nights that it was that you were a little uncomfortable or you felt like you needed to move along. That's yeah. not bad. No, and to be honest, like even though I say that you know I didn't feel super safe in those couple of places, and my gut instinct was just to to get out. Most of the places that I've been to, even when somebody was like, "Oh, watch out for you know the next town," that like it can be really sketchy in this area, and you got to be careful of this area. And when I got to those places, I had I met some of the nicest people, had some of the greatest experiences. Like everybody's just like, "Oh, watch out for the next thing down the road." But when you get there, it's even. <laughs> You know, it's the, it's exactly like where you just came from. So it's almost like you just have to experience those things for yourselves and see what it's really like. And, you know, I met some, like I said, just really amazing people along the way. So Yeah, yeah who, I mean, I, I got to imagine, I mean, there's there's probably hundreds of stories, but yeah, a, a couple couple people that you, you met along the way that, that stood out or that you, you're friends with to this day or... Oh, yeah. Definitely. You know, uh, like your your river rafting buddies down there that you uh, had the <laughs> rave with or, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's, there's I got to imagine there's got to be a ton of people that, that you met along the way that just enhanced there this are. whole experience. 
There are. Uh, there was a family in Tennessee at a campground that I was at in Tennessee that saw me drive by with the Jeep and they like sought me out when I had <laughs> finally parked and set up the tent because they saw me roll in with the tent on top of the uh-huh. Jeep. I gotta see this thing. It looks so cool. They wanted, you know, the grand sure. tour. So uh, they just loved it and they invited me back to their campsite that night. They fed me pulled pork and, Ooh. you know, all sorts of amazing southern barbecue. Cool. Uh, yeah, it was phenomenal. And like, we just exchanged stories and they told me all about their, you know, ranch in Tennessee and they're going to send me half a cow or something. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be I hard to fit in that Dometic <laughs> refrigerator of yours. I know, I know. Oh my gosh. So funny. So uh, I still talk to them and, uh, exchange, you know, stories with them and everything. And they started following me along the rest of the trip. And cool. then, uh, I met a couple of guys from, uh, they, I think it's SoCal off-road, uh, off-road trail runners, Southern California, if I uh-huh. remember, is the name of the club. And they were out in Arizona on the Schnebly Hill Trail the day I was out there. And, you know, we actually met because I had stopped at the overlook at the top of the trail to take some photos and just, you know, take in the scenery. And they rolled in probably 15 minutes after I did. And we just sort of got to chatting. They were wheeling their Tacoma out there. Um, and it was just a cool experience getting to you know chat with them and see how the other half of the trail had gone for them. And they invited me to camp with them that night. So we ended up camping just outside of the south rim of the Grand Canyon uh, together that night and exchanged contact information. And I still chat with those guys, too. Uh, one of them is actually talking about buying a campground and having me run it for him. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of funny. We uh, we became fast friends. They slapped a sticker on the back of the Jeep, and off we went. Cool. So, cool. So Boom. Guys <laughs> and uh, the ranchers in Montana. So when I finally rolled into Broadus, um, you know, for that five days that I was there hunting, there's, you know, one restaurant and bar in Broadus, Montana, and I ended up going in there, I think the second night that I was there, you know, because sometimes I like somebody else to pour my whiskey for Heck me. Heck yeah. <laughs> so I walked in there and, you know, top shelf for them is Pendleton. Yeah. Oh, there you go. A Canadian. <laughs> Yep, exactly. So uh, I'm sitting there drinking Pendleton on the rocks, talking to a bunch of cowboys in the bar in Montana, and ended up meeting the most amazing ranch family from uh, just outside of Broadus. And they invited me to not only hunt on their ranch that week, but also just come visit and watch them uh, work cows and everything the week that I was there. So I got like the full Montana ranch experience watching them wrangle cows. And it was just like, it was very, very cool. cool. I love Montana. Oh yeah. So I think fast friends at that. Their kids are literally climbing all over me. Like it was so a lot of fun i had such a great time up there with them so i'm in uh, i'm in touch with those uh that family still now and i uh, can't wait to get back and visit them and cool. made some other friends while i was in broadus for you know the five days i was there so it'll be nice to get back up there and uh and get to hang out with all of them again wow. when this is sort of over <laughs> see that's so cool so oh, yeah. so how many weeks or days total was your your round trip so to speak here It was just about six weeks. So it was around six weeks. Okay. Six weeks. I put about 9,500 miles on the Jeep when all was said and done. Yeah. On that one, on that one trip. But pretty much after the Badlands, I just made a beeline east. It was, like I said, the weather was starting to turn to pretty, getting pretty cold. And, um, you know, things were just campgrounds start closing and, you know, forest roads start closing for the winter. Winter setting in. Yeah. Yep. So, so I just wanted to, because I wasn't used to traveling that way for, you know, years and years, and I hadn't gotten to which campgrounds were open in the winters and things like that. I just sort of, I wanted to head out while it was, while I was still able and there were still quite a few places open and options and things along those lines. So yeah, so I got back uh, October 26th, I think it was. Okay. But uh, yeah, it was epic. <laughs> I mean, but yeah, these were like up in Niagara Falls. So wow, um, and and no mechanical issues, no major mechanical issues. <laughs> oh, Uh-oh. funny you should say that. No major mechanical. Yeah, issues. I figured there had to be something, you know, oh, a, yeah. a nail I mean, on the tire or something. Oh, but uh, yeah, you don't get out of this smoothly. Yeah, ninety five hundred miles. Whatsoever. 
whatever. I mean, we're still talking about a Jeep here. So. <laughs> God knows I love them, but, uh, but I wasn't getting out of this completely unscathed. Right. Um, I was coming out of the Grand Canyon the, the, actually the day that I ended up going deep into that campsite on the West Rim. It was, it was earlier that day. And I was coming out of the South Rim, and all of a sudden, the Jeep bucked hard in the middle of the road, and then I just lost engine power completely. Uh The dashboard lights up. I'm like, oh, crap. So so I pull the Jeep over the side of the road, and I carry um, one of those Flash Cal programmers uh, in the glove box. So I plug that in, read the codes, and it was just – it was some – Stupid little part, the camshaft position sensor. Oh, yeah, yeah, camshaft yeah. position sensor. Oh, my God. It's a stupid little $20 plastic magnet mm-hmm. part that will completely disable your vehicle. Shut, with shut it down, yeah. Yep. <laughs> so uh, it ended up being that. And unfortunately, I was – the closest town was Williams, Arizona, which is actually where the Casey Highlights headquarters is. Oh, yeah. Oh. So, yeah, so I was like, okay, well, you know, I'll limp it to Williams and – of course, by the time I get there, there is not a camshaft position sensor for a Jeep to be found anywhere in the town of Williams. So I ended up having to go. I had a friend who, actually, my friend from Tahoe, um, saw that I was in trouble because I, of course, you know, what's, what's the first thing you do? Post it to Instagram. <laughs> right. IG. I'm out in the middle of the desert. <laughs> yeah, you know, whatever. So he's like, where are you? What do you need? What can I help you with? And he ended up calling around to some of the auto parts places and found me um, a camshaft position sensor at um, an auto parts shop in Flagstaff. So all I had to do was limp the Jeep from the south rim of the Grand Canyon 40 some odd miles back to Flagstaff. I ended up having to pull over and uh, clear the codes and reset the uh, computer, I want to say three or four times. Mm. Between the South Rim and Flagstaff. So as soon as you clear the codes and um, and uh, reset the computer, the Jeep goes back to being drivable again until it, you know, throws another code, sure. camp, picks it up. And, oh, my gosh, it was just – it was such a pain. But – Change that out in the parking lot of an O'Reilly in Flagstaff, which was hilarious because I have all of these guys who are coming by the Jeep looking at me like, do I help her? Yeah. Or is, is this like a Me Too thing where I shouldn't offer? Like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's hilarious. That's like, funny. You know, when you can like kind of sense that they want to ask you, yeah. like, oh, is it like not socially acceptable to ask a chick <laughs> if she needs help with her? <laughs> I don't know. So, oh, my God. It was funny. But I finally, you know, get this all, you know, fixed up and get back on the road. And that was kind of why I was even more hesitant to go, you know, 18 miles down this dirt road that night, just not knowing if this fix would be the, you know, the thing that actually was wrong or if there was an underlying issue or anything along those lines. So I was just really hesitant at first. Yeah, and then ended up having the greatest night ever. (laughs) That's the adventure within the adventure, right? Yeah, it's not an adventure until everything goes wrong, right? (laughs) It's not a party until somebody gets hurt, and then it's freaking (laughs) so. uh, Jeez. (laughs) So, other than the uh, cam position sensor, uh, anything else um, along those lines, or just just common little by some miracle of God? Wow, that's awesome. (laughs) performed beautifully all around the country so i told there was one one moment when i was in death valley it was 105 degrees in death valley when i was rolling through there with uh with the huntress and i kind of made this deal with her as we were pulling into the valley and i'm like you get me out of here and i will like take good care of you you know what i mean (laughs) yeah for me through all this sweetheart and i will take care of you i promise so i started wash wax oh yeah I started seeing the temperature gauge getting around like 2.30 Ooh, or so yeah. and pretty steady around 2.30. And I'm like, you know what? Not even going to chance it. I pulled over, opened the hood, let it cool off a little bit and uh, just sort of babied it all through Death Valley. You know, anytime it got to, you know, around 2.30 sure. or so, I'd just, I'd pull over. Because again, like here I am running 6,100 something pounds sure. a year around in a JKU with a six cylinder engine. And I just, I I did, um, the one thing that it does have is that it's got a different air intake in it that I really have liked. Uh, so I, I had that going for me, but I upgraded, I think that was the first thing I did actually was upgrade the air intake. Okay. Um, 
So it does have a really nice cold air system, but even that wasn't enough when I'm chugging up hills in Death Valley with 6,000 something pounds and I have, uh, I'm geared at 373. So it's, oh, you know, yeah. it's kind of like at the point where I could definitely think about a regear. I'm you could have put it in low range. I did. <laughs> I know. It was just like, I kind of did a You've hope and 40. a prayer thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I was out of, gosh, crawling up most of those hills. I think I was in second gear. Yeah. So, yeah, it was, uh, you know, I just, I was really careful with it the whole time. And I just said, like I said, you take care of me, I'll take care of you. And I ended up stopping, uh, where was I? I think it was, it was just on the other side of Death Valley. I can't remember the name of the town, but it's, it's not even a town actually. It's like a a blip on the map. That's got like three buildings in it. I don't even, I don't even remember the name of it. (laughs) One of the buildings is like a hotel restaurant bar combination of things. And I, uh, I pulled in there and stopped long enough to, you know, grab a burger or something and let the Jeep cool down and ended up rolling out of Death Valley and towards Alabama Hills in like the cool of the evening. And it was just a, it was a gorgeous drive. So yeah, so it was nice. And of course, cool enough that I didn't have to worry about the Jeep anymore at that point and overheating and everything. And just the views of Star Wars Canyon and everything as you're kind of coming out of Death Valley and into Lone Pine are just stunning. Oh yeah. Yeah. So I imagine you and the uh, Huntress have had some very in-depth conversations together. (laughs) We certainly have. (laughs) Out in the backwoods or the the deserts, and yeah. it's like, okay, okay, oh, give me, give me, give me to the campsite, give me, oh, give me out of here. Have we ever? <laughs> wow, there's you. You get a lot of time to, to think and talk to yourself when you're yes. on trip like this. So. so you got like you got like music cranking, or you just just let the uh, had the windows down and just the open road sound, yeah. or what? Or you listen to podcast like, or. I, I, I do. I listen to. Uh, I do do the podcast thing once in a while. Okay. Um, there's a couple that I have on my list that I really enjoy. There's, uh, you know, some days I'm, you know, bumping some tunes in the back. I've got that kicker subwoofer. I've got to take advantage of. There you go. <laughs> yeah. I refused to take it out. It's of the got. Gym. You got to have the tunes. Got to have the tunes. I had to have it. So, uh, so some days I'm doing that, and then some days I'm just like sitting there quietly, just listening to the road noise and opening up the windows and just appreciating, you know, sure the trip for what it is. So, Living in the moment. Yeah. Exactly. So a little, a little combination okay. of all of those things, really. But <laughs> that's cool. What? Yeah. Uh, so out of that trip, what was like, and you kind of alluded to it, but, uh, what was your favorite campsite or, you know, the, Ooh. Um, let's see some of my all time favorites. I would say, uh, one of the, one of the really nice ones that I loved was the BLM campsites in New Mexico. Um, I don't even think it had a name per se. Uh-huh. But uh, it was in an it was an overlook over gosh I think it was like Santa Santa something Lake Santa Cruz Lake Overlook or something in New Mexico that one was beautiful the views were just amazing (laughs) really did you find it no No, Lorenzo Lorenzo's trying to do some research here but he's he's (laughs) he's a lazy ass. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I, I want to say was, that one in New Mexico is pretty amazing. And then um, the Black Hills, because of course you can camp anywhere in the Black Hills off of the, the trails in there. So those places were, those were really yeah, nice. Yeah, that sounded cool. Especially down on the rivers and things like that. But, you know, aside from the obvious epic one down on the Colorado River that night with the river rafters, those were, those were some of my favorites. So, yeah. Right Far- on. Oh, yeah. And it, then uh, there's some there's a lot of good free camping options around the country if you just look for them. Right. Yeah. And it sounds like those apps that you listed, too, sounded like were pretty helpful. Oh, uh, definitely. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And there's so much out there now on the web and these people that do boondock and overland and whatever out there camping. Uh, you know, they probably don't share their, their most favorite area, but there there is a lot of cool 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 uh gps coordinates for some unique camp spots uh around the united states here 
I'm very lucky to have, you know, made this network of friends around the country who are willing to share some of their secret spots with me. So I won't divulge them on here. Obviously, sure, sure. But, uh, but the ones that I mentioned are some ones that are public that anybody can cool. find. So, so yeah, you can definitely, you can check those out for sure. So is, is, uh, begs the question then, so who, yeah, who do you follow that has done similar things to, to what you've done? Or, or I know there's, you know, some, some people out there doing this full time, um, now as well. Yep. Uh, the, the, uh, oh gosh, I can't think of his name, but down to mob, uh, that guy, he just bought a JL, oh, uh, I don't gladiator. Know Oh yeah, yeah. He had a, a Dodge, and he got Ooh, finally he wised up around the campfire one night over some bourbon that Dodges are no good and needs to get a Jeep. So, really? Yeah. Oh, oh sorry, well, Chris. Then. Chris has a Dodge truck. That's why I say that. My feelings are hurt. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, who who um, who are some of the people that that uh, that you follow or or in conversations with? Oh, sure. Absolutely. So a um, couple of the friends that I've made in Arizona. So if you're familiar with um, Millennium Overland is his Instagram handle. So if you look at, at Millennium Overland, okay, um, he's given me some really good suggestions and some sites and things like that down in uh, the Arizona area. Same thing. They're, they kind of run in a club together. So Freedom Overland is another one of the Instagram handles you can kind of look for. Um, he's also given me some great ideas, rolling dirty overland. Um, oh, like these one. are all guys that are in the Southwest because I, I just didn't have a lot of experience in the Southwest and, um, being in a lot of those sort of, um, terrains and things like that. So I was getting a lot of information from those guys and a lot of, uh, a lot of good ideas. And I knew that if anything happened to me out there, I could definitely reach out to them. Um, Windrift Overland. I think he's now Windrift Adventure, but okay. um, but definitely him also for just some inspiration and areas to go. Um, and then as far as like gear and things like that, and uh, just ideas and stuff. Uh, I don't know if you follow Jillian Rebecca, but of course, following a woman who does you know similar stuff sure. and thing like she's uh, her personality is cool. Um, I love, you know, just getting ideas from some of her posts and things like that. I follow, you know, the people that everybody else follows too, like lifestyle overland and, uh, Kate, the Jeep and accounts like that, that I, I, and I also love his rig for dirt podcast too. Um, I've been listening to them, uh, do their thing. And then I think it's trucky McTruck face. Isn't oh yeah. Trucky McTruck face. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, and of course recipes from, uh, Marco overland X <laughs> uh, cooking recipes. Yep. So, so many good ideas from those guys out there. Um, other than that, just, you know, I follow the hashtag overlanding or overland expo and sure. I get, you know, ideas from people all over the place. So, but definitely, you know, the, the crew out there is really inspiring to me because they are always posting, um, wheeling stuff in the Southwest and trails that they're hitting in the Southwest and gear that they're loving and everything out there. And so, yeah, so that's, that's cool. <laughs> Yeah, oh, I mean that's the great thing with the social media thing now is that yeah you can get connected with all these people. Uh, you know that's like what we've learned with this podcast. I mean it's been it's been so much fun uh, getting to talk to people like you and and uh, all these different you know aspects of off road right. from yeah. you know major hardcore rock crawling where you're going to roll over to you know mild wheeling to overlanding to, to racing oh rock landing we've got we've got friends yeah, yeah. That, have you heard of rock landing this is new to me i'm not sure i know what rock landing yeah is. so uh so friends of ours uh, that have another podcast uh, snail trail four by four so they they i don't know they didn't coin the term but they've they've been using it so it's like they have a, a setup toyota truck with mm -hmm. a rooftop tent in the back so oh, it's like cool. they go rock crawling but you know they got the the rooftop tent and the the creature comforts there on the on the trail. Oh um, yeah. You know, so when I go out and do the the uh, Rubicon or a couple of these trails, Barrett, where we actually camp on the trail, I'm forced to camp yeah. on the trail because I can't get my camper in there <laughs> to set up a base camp. <laughs> You know, so they 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 got they got the creature comforts, and I'm sleeping in a tent. You know, so I I, I do rough it about four or five nights a year. That's that's oh uh, that's oh wow. So I do get a little taste. It keeps me grounded. 
Um, but anyways, yeah, they call that rock landing. So that we've we've kind of uh, coined that term because we're, gotcha. you know, the the overland thing I've been learning about, and uh, it, it definitely a huge trend. You were at SEMA uh, this past year. Yes. Oh yeah. How God. about that overland section? I mean, that was oh, incredible. It was so cool. Yeah. Um, I spent quite a bit of time in that bill. Actually. Pretty much all the, the time. The whole I time in that. <laughs> in that in that one building. Yeah, we is um, outside. I mean, a lot of the action's actually outdoors. Oh yeah. So, yep. Um, and obviously, you know, some of the really cool rigs, like the Earth Roamers and yeah. things like that, were all oh, yeah. outside. So, got to actually, um, the crew from Earth Roamer actually invited me and uh, my friend Jonathan, the photographer that I was talking about from Tahoe, who was with me in SEMA. Um, they invited us into the earth roamer to kind of get a little tour of the inside and have a chat. They were pretty much gating everybody out, but, um, (laughs) but we got to hang out in there and have a little happy hour at the end of (laughs) right on. (laughs) That's cool. A day two or something with the earth roamer crew Uh. and, uh, and get a close up experience with the new LTI. So yeah, that was really, really neat. Um, but they had some other rigs there, obviously like the earth cruiser was there. Um, what else there was, uh, Oh, so one of my uh, one of my friends actually from New Hampshire who has um, a metal fabrication company and a garage, uh, Lucky Gunner Garage in North Conway, New Hampshire, had a bug out vehicle that he built from scratch, wow. like from the frame up. Okay, it's a sort of personal survival vehicle. It was just nuts. He had that thing there with the the Rhino lining guys, I think it was. Or, oh, uh, I yeah. do remember seeing that now. Uh, that's what it was. He yep. was there with Linex. Yeah, yeah, Linex. Yeah. Linex. So that's actually so that's my friend Gus. So okay. That, that Linex rig, that black. Um, it almost sort of looks like it could have potentially <laughs> been built off of a Jeep platform. <laughs> yeah. But it was really like custom from the frame up. So. The- yeah, really cool rig. Um, some just some really neat. I know the Bound for Nowhere guys were out there. Right. Uh, uh-huh. too. So they're full time on the road um, with their kind of truck camper setup, but. Yeah, I mean, some really neat inspirational stuff at SEMA and, uh, you know, in that Overland building and everything. And I know that the um, Trail Recon guys were out behind the Overland uh, experience. And they've obviously got some really epic setups that they're they're rolling around with. I think he had the Gladiator there at SEMA this year. And it was it was just really neat to get a chance to walk around those things and get to see all these rigs close up and, you know, put faces to the names and the Instagram handles and all that stuff. Exactly. Uh, It was amazing to me um, because last year when we went, it was like, I mean, they had, you know, we spend most of our time in the off road section and they had, you know, rooftop tents and some overlanding, you know, they kind of had a little section carved out. And then to go from that to what they had this year, this, this past SEMA 19 was like, holy crap, they got, a, you know, and they, the whole section. Yeah. yeah I mean, they obviously knew that it was going to be popular, but they were like, oh, let's, let's set up a tent and see how this thing goes. Well, now, you know, it's going to be a staple of the show, uh, because oh, it was yeah. wildly popular, um, and even, you know, I was, I, I, I mean, I was like, okay, overland section, let's go check it out, you know, and I walk in there and I'm like, wow, there's some cool stuff in here and some cool builds. Well, they had the Lance Campers. Oh, and then they had the Lance Campers there too, of yeah. course. So that's, yeah. that's kind of like the crazy, uh, well, there are some, some seriously built four wheel drive trucks that have Lance Campers on them where people are going, uh, in some hardcore terrain. But anyways, it, it was cool. It, that was super cool. Oh, yeah. Lots of good gear ideas wandering around. The oh, world. yeah, I'm sure uh, you're, you're like, ooh, I could use that. Um, <laughs> any uh, going back to your trip, was there any uh, you have any animal issues, uh, bears or anything like that that you uh, encountered along the way? Uh, I didn't have any issues with them if okay. you will like obviously okay. you've got to be careful as far as uh the wildlife's concerned especially in a lot of the national parks so i was just yeah. really cautious you know they provide bear boxes right. for you know yosemite and yellowstone and grand teton and places like that where you're running into you know black bears and grizzly bear country and everything um we didn't come across any so my sister and i in yellowstone or anything like that like we didn't even we didn't see a single bear the entire time we were out in Yosemite, I, you know, I saw some, but I was just driving through the park at the time. By the time I camped, right. I didn't come across any out there. 
I did get to see a lot of wildlife while I was driving around, which was awesome, uh, especially actually in the Grand Canyon, um, between mule deer and jackrabbits and bobcats and oh, elk and all sorts of cool stuff. The so, donkeys. Yeah. Yeah, it was really – I mean, I've seen so much cool wildlife. The only the only one wildlife issue that I had was uh, a bison that wouldn't move from the front of my Jeep. So <laughs> I literally couldn't, I couldn't drive because he was standing right in front of my rig blocking <laughs> the road. So – and I was not about to be that ass that gets – Yeah, honking like, horns. And at him to get him to move or anything like that. Right, so like, no mm-hmm. amount of honking is going to move a bison. I don't yeah, care. no. But. <laughs> didn't give him a little nudge. Exactly. So we just sort of enjoyed the experience and I just sort of <laughs> held on to the wheel like, okay, like I'll just, uh, he's a little too close for comfort at this point. So, there you go. Well, yeah, just enjoyed that photographic opportunity. But no, I never like, I mean, nothing ever really bothered me. There was one night, oh God, that's, this was actually kind of funny. In the Badlands, I didn't realize the uh, the campground that I was in is actually like a free dispersed campground uh, just outside of Badlands National Park. And that whole night, <laughs> there were just coyotes all around me, oh. just like barking, yipping, howling back and forth at each other. And it's not like, it does not bother me. It doesn't right. raise me, it doesn't scare me. Like they're coyotes, whatever. I'm in a rooftop tent. I'm used to it. But they were obviously keeping me awake all night because they're loud and like that's they're like literally all around me. And I couldn't quite figure out why there were so many of them there. And so the next morning I get up and all of a sudden from all around me, about a hundred prairie dogs poke their head. The campground is actually a prairie dog town. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and I, I was like, well, that explains there's, there's, the yeah, food. coyotes all around my tent all night long. Oh, my gosh. That's hilarious. <laughs> They're just these little fat furry sure. <laughs> out of holes all around me. And I'm laughing so hard at this point because, like, I finally put two and two together. That's great. And they're just, like, they're so cute and furry and, like, fat and happy. And, oh, my God, it was hilarious. But, yeah. Apparently good eating for coyotes, yeah. too. Apparently. Apparently. <laughs> my God. So I got a kick out of that. But <laughs> but no no issues, fortunately. Okay. That's, that's I good. I have heard stories. I think, like, two weeks, two weeks prior to – when I was coming through a couple of the a couple of the campgrounds that were known for bears like Yosemite and oh, uh, yeah. Stone and stuff like that, there was a woman who was camping uh, on, in a ground tent, and she had her jeep broken into by two black bears that like completely destroyed the interior yeah. of her jeep. So that had happened like I think two weeks, like I said, before I reached a couple of those places. And I was just like, okay, well, you know, noted. <laughs> We've, uh, Chris and I have had a few bear experiences in Yosemite. Oh, I've, really? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've seen them uh, several times. I mean, they're, they're, you know, there's so many people there. And, and oh. you know, there's the Some city, it's, the city, it's come in there and, and, yeah, and then leave food out. And, of course, the bears <laughs> know. And, I mean, we watched one night. Uh, this this bear we called him Yogi because he was pretty smart. Um, <laughs> he went up and he, you know, there's bear boxes there. Oh yeah, and Absolutely. they they latched. But these were the old ones, so if you you had to kind of like slip with your thumb um, this little tab over and then lift up, and then oh. when you when you closed it, it it like you know latched down just like a, a door, you know, so you'd thumb it to to open it well you know now they've gotten way better and and more secure because this bear knew there was some of them that that little latch was loose and he went over and he went to one bear box and he's like nope that's not it went to the next one and that was the one and he just lifted up on it and was able to open it and just totally cleaned out the contents and we sat there and watched this whole thing like wow and then you know they got they got the bear police in yosemite there's a whole, there's a whole, uh, you know, crew uh, that yeah. that is nothing but bear control. Rangers, yeah. yeah, and and so they came up, and it was like you know eleven o'clock at night or something, and uh, they, they, you know, they go, hey, there's bears over here, and they, okay, and I said, hey, can we follow you guys? And he goes, just stay behind us, don't do anything stupid, and stay behind <laughs> us. Okay, fine. So we were, you know, behind them as they were escorting this bear out of the campground. And then uh, they hit it with the tranquilizer dart, and you had to wait, you know, a good 
eight, 10 minutes for the, the tranquilizer dart to kick in. And then one of the rangers gonna, you know, heads over to it slowly. It starts to move again, so they hit it with another dart. And uh, then, then uh, you know, it was tagged, and they're like, oh, yeah, it's number, you know, 57 or whatever. And they had a name for it. And Yogi. Yeah, Yogi. <laughs> And uh, and then they they hauled them off. But anyways, it's just uh, Yosemite's crazy because of there's so many tourists that that leave food around and and these, these bears, you know, free oh, food absolutely. sitting on a table. They're they're going to go for it. Hell yeah, absolutely. But so talk about your, uh, you know, you were involved with uh, you've been hunting for a long time and conservation and stuff, and you actually taught conservation for a while. Yeah. So, uh, gosh, hunting's sort of been in my family for generations. And uh, when I was about seven years old, my father handed me a BB gun and let me walk around the woods with him while we were (laughs) pheasant hunting. And I obviously didn't know what I was doing. I had, you know, I don't even think it was loaded actually while we were walking around, even though it was just a little BB gun. And, uh, you know, at the end of these bird hunts, because of course, when you're pheasant hunting, you can make all the noise you want and move around. Right. You know, at seven years old, I, hell, it's hard to keep me quiet now, let alone when I was seven years old. So, so yeah, so uh, he would line up, you know, some cans or bottles or something that somebody had thrown in the woods and he'd line them up on a log and let me plink away at him when we were, when we were done with the hunt. And it just got me, you know, interested. I loved walking around the woods with him no matter what. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, the shooting at the end was just kind of a bonus. And then, you know, the older I got, the more I got involved in, um, the hunting process. So like turkey hunting and deer hunting and things like that were interesting to me. And I started, uh, as when I was a teenager, I got my, uh, hunter ed certificate and okay. started, you know, going out and we'd go, we'd go turkey hunting, we'd go deer hunting. Um, I think I got my first turkey when I was like 17 and about the same time frame for my first deer. And I was just hooked. I just love, I love any excuse to be out in the woods. And I love the the sort of conservation aspect of being a hunter or just, you know, being an avid outdoor enthusiast. And I, by the time I was 23, I had taken the certification course to get my hunter ed instructor certification. So I started teaching the hunter ed courses when I was 23 years old. Yeah. And, uh, that was just something that I really enjoyed doing for the, for the state of New Hampshire. And then a few years later, I, um, started doing this wildlife stewardship program where I would travel around the state teaching conservation classes to different adult groups, all about conservation initiatives in the state of New Hampshire. So when it came to um, the bear population and what New Hampshire is doing about the the bear population and bobcats and things like that, uh, it was just a cool opportunity for me to, to reach out to a totally different group of people, even the non-hunting public about just wildlife initiatives and conservation initiatives for the state. And then several years after that, and this was just uh, within the last couple of years, um, I was reached out to by a couple of assistants to the governor of New Hampshire. And they were looking for someone to be the conservation commissioner for the county that I lived in in New Hampshire. And it's basically the Conservation Commission in New Hampshire is uh, something that a lot of other states don't have. It's pretty unique to the state of New Hampshire, and it's a civilian kind of committee that oversees the um, governmental entity that is the New Hampshire Fish and Game Department. So, okay. yeah, so you have a lot of control over the rulemaking process and funding and things along those lines. So I was uh, kind of asked because of my background in uh, – wildlife, um, management, as far as the stewardship, uh, program went and, you know, my hunter ed, uh, instructor certification. And I also went to school. My degree is actually in pre-vet, which is completely opposite from what I ended up doing. <laughs> yeah. I did, I'm in marketing. So I'm like, this is completely off the wall, but, uh, but my degree is actually in pre-veterinary medicine. And so with that and the animal yeah. science background, um, yeah, I was asked to participate in this commission and it's been a really it's been a really cool opportunity to get even more involved in the kind of, you know, like I said the rulemaking process and like actually being a part of kind of the the future of conservation initiatives. Sure. For this so yeah, so it's been that was really awesome and I just I love 
to sort of get myself involved in those things and uh, also to just educate people about those things, which is a little bit of what I bring into um, the posts on my Instagram feed. Like anytime I go somewhere and experience a new place or, you know, on a hunt or something like that, I try to sort of give people a little insight as to the background of, you know, those places that I'm in and, you know, maybe the wildlife that I saw or something along those lines and just kind of also make them, the posts are, you know, pretty because I like to think that the photography is, you know, all right. (laughs) No, it's great. But but also I like to make it a little bit of an educational opportunity for me to sort of spread my passion for the outdoors and wildlife and conservation and just, um, you know, kind of environment in general. But yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank Holy you. Smokes. Thank you. Um, so what else? Do, oh, got to ask the question since this <laughs> is wheeling wine and whiskey. What's your what's your favorite wine? What's your favorite whiskey? Oh, my favorite wine and my favorite whiskey. Okay, so uh, the only wine I have ever actually dedicated myself to <laughs> and, uh, and really... Um, actually I joined the club, the whole nine yards, like had oh. it shipped my house and everything was, uh, Jay Ricard's winery just outside. It's in the Alexander Valley, yeah. actually, California. Um, yeah, I fell in love with just like the guy who runs the vineyard. So his name's John, John Ricards and, uh, the property that he had out there that he just like, he built these, this beautiful barn and just like grew these vines and just set up these vineyards from nothing. Like the land was just barren when he got it. And, uh, his whole backstory and like the story of his family and the actual wines that they're producing there, they grow some really different varietals out there, which is cool. Um, some things that I'd never actually had a chance to taste before. Uh, they make a rosé of, um, Oh God, I think it's like Aliatico or something okay, like that. Okay. Yeah. Totally some, different varietal that I had some had crazy any. varietal yeah and uh and they're making some really good wines out of these things out there so i that one's probably on my list of uh of top 10 things out there and then basically anything that comes from michael david so well, there you go <laughs> i like to call it the, the the fat dancing elephant wine i think it's actually the petit petit <laughs> is like one of my like budget favorites because i think it's usually like anywhere from 15 to 20 dollars a bottle or something but uh but it's one of my one of my go-tos uh let's see whiskey uh so i've recently been introduced to a couple that i have very much enjoyed one was uh jefferson's reserve so it's a really small batch yeah yeah it's that was fantastic so i've been enjoying that for the last few months and i think that one's that one's pretty high on the top of my list at this point and then uh, the Four Roses single barrel. Yeah, so. that's that's a classic. <laughs> that's very it's good. Go to, and I actually that was another one that my Tahoe friend introduced me to. So I hadn't had it until uh, until that, and uh, it's it's now sort of on my go to list. <laughs> yeah, see, it's bad when you when you taste the you know it's like hey you want some bourbon or whatever and you try it and then you ruin people because they're like oh my god that's great where do I get well that's kind of hard to get or it's an eighty dollar <laughs> bottle or you know you're like damn. <laughs> Definitely. Why can't Definitely. I like the cheap stuff? <laughs> there's, uh, there's actually a very, very small distillery in New Hampshire. I think it's uh, just outside the the naval shipyard there called uh, – God, I, I actually don't even know if I remember the name. I think it's Smoky Quartz. Okay. And their – I mean their whiskey bottles are you know basically no bigger than the size of a coffee mug in some cases. Oh and they're just these like super small batch whiskeys. But I've had really good experiences with some of their bottles too. There's a, a different flavor profile from one to the next obviously being sure. that small batch. But, um, but some of them have been really, really good. Smoky Quartz I think it's called. Smoky Quartz. And I'm pretty sure it's all veteran owned and operated too. Oh, that's even better. Which is really neat. Yeah. So, uh, so that's it's- been a good one. Well, and then you you uh, made me aware of of one in my backyard. Well, up in Truckee, uh, the old trestle. <laughs> old trestle, yeah. So the, I actually I haven't had their. I think they're distilling a bourbon literally as we. So speak. So it's aging in the barrel as we speak. Yes, yeah. they release it this summer. Exactly, exactly. But um, the head distiller Jake um, is just a really all around cool guy. He gave me a tour of the distillery when I was in Truckee uh, this past fall um, along that trip that I was taking. 
And at the time, they had just bottled their theory uh, number two, I think, or they were in actively bottling theory number two. They had already bottled theory number one, one of their gins. The gins, yes. And, uh, yeah, and then theory number two was uh, getting ready to be bottled. And it was just a super florally gin that had, I think it was brewed with tea, if I remember correctly. Yeah, in a Chinese five spice, too. Yeah, it was finished, yeah. finished with a black tea. Such a unique flavor. Super and, unique. Uh, oh, yeah. So I got to taste that while I was there at the distillery and just like chat with him about all the different components of it and, uh, and you know, the process, the distilling process and see all the equipment. And he kind of gave me a run through of how everything works. And it was just a, it was a really neat experience to not just like have the tasting experience, but also like for Jake to share, you know, his knowledge and give me a little little education on the process was, was really neat. So. Well, he's, he's passionate, just like you are with the outdoors. Uh, I am with the outdoors. And then, you know, you meet Jake that's just super passionate about <laughs> distilling. So I, I, and I, he has an epic beard. I mean. Oh, my I, gosh. So, <laughs> so this was great because you had put up a post uh, and it was uh, uh, close to, to New Year's. Um, anyway, something and, and, uh, mentioned old trestle distillery in Truckee. And I'm like, God, I didn't even know Truckee had a distillery. So I started <laughs> checking it out and you and I DM, uh, a little bit. And, and so I, I hit up, um, DM to old trestle and I go, Hey, I'm going to be in the area at the end of the year and uh would love to come by and check it out i got this podcast wheeling wine and whiskey and le- and so anyways then jake and i exchanged numbers and it was new year's eve and uh he goes hey i'm gonna be down here till you know eight o'clock or so you're, you're welcome to come down and yeah. so i think i went down there at like four o'clock and um and stayed there till nine o'clock. We ended up leaving at like nine o'clock, spent five hours with him and just dropping knowledge bombs left and right on me, talking <laughs> about the whole process, walking through the whole operation. Uh, got to try the gins. I am not a gin person, but I did enjoy those gins because they were well, so unique. A unique flavor profile. Yeah. In that. But I think that's, uh, they're, they're not gins like you you they're not your typical juniper bomb gin that that you know you would get a bombay or whatever uh yeah and then i got to try some of the the bourbon that was outstanding and anyway so uh, you know i was my intention was just to interview him and then and then do a a podcast and i go now after i met him and he's such a character i'm like we got to do this in person man (laughs) So he, we're, we'll catch up as soon as this COVID thing, uh, shelter in place gets lifted and I get to go back up to the mountains and, uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll get Jake on. So look for a, uh, an interview with him in the future here on the podcast. Yes, sir. <laughs> That's very cool. Yeah. Um, oh my gosh. We covered a lot of, gr- this is, this is incredible. So, so what's, uh, what's. What's your future plans? Uh, oh, gosh, what's... I mean, like I said, once I once I put my post apocalyptic outfit together, yes, <laughs> get myself back on the road. Um, so I'm bound for the West, really. At this point, okay. Uh, I fell. I just fell in love with the American West. Not just on this last trip, but ten years ago, my first trip west back in 2009, and uh, I've been wanting to move west for a decade. Uh-huh. So it's. Uh, I finally put myself in a position where, like I said, I can work from anywhere. Uh, my job is in digital marketing and nice. marketing management, and everything's pretty much remote at this point. So I uh, I just, now that I can sort of be freed up to travel around, then I'm I'm headed west of the Mississippi, man. I need some open open territory and some okay, more wheeling right opportunities. So, and I'm not, I'm not quite sold on exactly where yet. Um, I definitely want to spend a lot more time in Arizona. I want to, you know, get some more time on the trails around Sedona and Flagstaff area. Cause I just, I, like I said, I fell in love with those trails out there. They're just beautiful. Um, and like just nice, you know, I, I love a good trail that's like moderate wheeling. There's some technicality to it. So you're, you're still having fun, but sure. like you don't have to worry about breaking things all the time. And, you know, you just, you get to enjoy the scenery instead of, you know, constantly fighting to pick the right line and things like that. So, uh, so there's some really good trails for that out there. And I just want to spend more time in, uh, the Southern California area. I've, I want to do Anza Borrego's on my list. Oh, big time. Uh-huh. 
I really want to see Anza and uh, also spending more time in Baja. I've I've been to Baja three or four times and I just, I love the Baja, Mexico area. Toto Santos is, you know, up on my list of places I really like to spend time in. So Some good head tacos down there. there too. Good oh my gosh. <laughs> the food. Oh my gosh. The food in Cabo area is yeah. just absolutely out of this world and like fresh. Oh, and so the seafood. Good. Yes. It's so oh. good. Oh, good. So, yeah, and I just love the Pacific side of Baja is just super cool. And, uh, you know, you get those crashing waves against the shore to lull you to sleep on your beachside campground at night. I mean, you look can't at, beat that. Look at you. So, just oh. took took us right there. Oh. Yeah, there you go. I'm a, I'm a pretty decent writer. It's kind of my job. So. There you go. <laughs> Jason's loading his camper on his truck yeah, right yeah. now. Yeah. Like, there you go. Okay, perfect. <laughs> So that's cool. All right. Well, if you make it back up to the the Sierra area, the the Trekkie visiting your friend in Tahoe, let us know. We'll see if uh, we're in the area. Oh and, yeah, I'll uh, be there. Yeah, we can. We can <laughs> I, I can turn you on to some other different whiskeys and and wines uh, too. Can we do a whiskey tasting. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes. Any anybody that knows the camps uh, with us, there's there's plenty of uh, wine and whiskey tasting going on. Oh well, I can also <laughs> around the campfire. Nominal dinners. So. <laughs> See, yeah, and you're a great cook. Uh, so <laughs> that, that's great. Your sister uh, cooks. I mean, this yeah, this is go. great. We're we're all foodies. We all love to uh, imbibe in the uh, fine. Uh, adult beverages and uh, yeah, it's it's <laughs> we, we find that's a common I theme out there. Zero, and I'll meet you out there. There you go. See, <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Perfect. Um, any anything else? Uh, any uh, I don't know. Do you have any sponsors or who who uh, anybody else you want to give a shout out to or anything? I am honestly like I'm just starting to sort of dip my toes into the world of sponsorship opportunities. Okay. So I mean, if anybody's interested, there I'm you, out here. There you go. <laughs> Boom. I did just start working actually with the Demos Collective. So they make the uh, off road shovels that you guys have kind of yeah. probably seen on a lot of the different accounts out there. Saw your post, um, and that thing like a full-size shovel when you put it together oh yeah it's not oh, one of those yeah. stupid little army shovels no 100 percent. like i'm six feet tall and it comes up to you know my chest level so it's uh it's definitely full size and it actually i discovered because uh, you know with the whole coronavirus situation going on anybody who manufactures anything is kind of is struggling to keep up the the workforce sure. to be able to keep manufacturing um kind of going and being as productive as they normally are. So they're actually, they're out of their mounts right now for the Delta shovels, which is the one that I have. But, um, I did remember that my AEV tire carrier actually has a space to mount a shovel in. And there's like, there's forums all over the internet about trying to find the perfect size shovel to fit in these AEV tire carriers because they don't actually sell one, which I think is funny. <laughs> uh, that is a little odd. <laughs> yeah. So, and this one just so happens to literally fit perfectly, and I could not believe it. So, <laughs> wow. Who would have thought? Like, what are the odds? It was just so. It it's was meant to be. Cool. Exactly. Meant yeah. To exactly. Be. It was so cool. So, uh, so I did just start working with them. So, shout out to them. Sweet. <laughs> And uh, hopefully, you know, get some potential opportunities to work with some people going forward. I'm I'm not one of those people who's just going to throw stuff on my Jeep because somebody is going to give me a free product. Like, I'm all about putting the stuff on there that's the best that I'm going to use that's really, you know, something that I would be interested in paying good money for anyway and, uh, and, you know, truly – you know, I, I put that stuff to work for sure. Absolutely. So I'm, I'm field testing the hell out of the stuff. Oh going on exactly. I mean, it's like I say, I want to go out and buy one of those goal zero, uh, Yeti 400s. Oh, uh, no, I, I don't know where I would use it. Uh, I think they just came out with a 500. That's the smaller size than the, than the 400 I got last year. So well, if I, had Jason, yeah, I mean, see, I'll, a lot of good stuff out there. Maybe I kick up my. Uh, see, I maybe I should just kind of kick up the rock landing game and get one of those smaller ones for the CJ5 for those couple nights I spend out on the Rubicon and just. Oh, hey, there you I can go. have full disco party in my my tent. <laughs> I got. <laughs> I did get you one of those. Not miss out on the rave opportunity. See, I do <laughs> like the tunes. 
Um, and we do set up quite the camp when we're, you know, with a, we got our campers where we got plenty of room to bring out and we build full kitchens and everything. We call them kitchen stadiums. Oh my God. Yeah. So we got the camp chef stoves and griddles and pizza ovens. And, uh, yeah, it, it, we even have a kitchen sink, uh, with us oh, sometimes. Wow. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it is. It's, it's pretty crazy. And, and we do some pretty elaborate meals, but, uh, yeah, that may, I, I may be, if I can uh, get things going, I could step up the, my rock landing game. Okay, <laughs> but I did get one of the, one of those gazelle uh, tents. Have you? If you um, you familiar? We probably not because you got your rooftop tent. But the, yeah. I, I've just I am familiar with a lot of the other companies that are out there. A lot of the other sort of brands and things that are uh, that do the different type of rooftop tent styles. I've seen you know a lot of the hard shells and a lot of the different. Um, sort of soft side fabric tents that are out there and everything. Uh, I just, again, like I went with the one that I have because it was a brand that I was familiar with. I knew that the quality was good. It was the size that I wanted. And I mean, I got a killer deal on that specific one. Yeah. <laughs> well, it sounds like it works out perfect for you. Yeah, that's yeah, that's great. The yeah. annex uh, that drops down the side. So obviously, like, that's the one thing you don't get with those hard shell tents um, that a lot of people, the fold up ones, the hard shells that a lot of people run right. now is the opportunity to run the annex and that was an absolute ne- like necessity for me so yeah that makes sense wow so cool yeah. well um i i think this is going to have to be continued because i know you're going to have some uh, future journeys <laughs> once uh once we're free to move about the country again yep, for oh sure. yeah oh definitely and uh yeah uh we're definitely so follow uh christina on uh, the gram at uh, Huntress Off Road, and uh, yeah, you got a ton of cool posts, and like I say, the the photo quality and everything's great. So it, these aren't just I like quick that. little, uh, you know, phone snapshots. There's actually some thought put into these. You can tell. So <laughs> I'm working hard at learning how to use that stuff. No, it's good. Yeah, I've learned a lot about Instagram, and I'm continue to learn. Uh, you know, trying to uh, you know grassroots build up our our podcast here right? and uh, social media and everything. So um, yeah, it's been fun. It's, it's been a blast. Very cool. Um, yeah. So, uh, and I love here on your, your, uh, what the main page of your Instagram, it says when in doubt whiskey and blind faith. That's pretty good. <laughs> That's a good, good theory. Yeah. There. I, like, <laughs> I like that. Thank you. <laughs> that actually, that saying came to me from a really good friend of mine who is Irish. So Oh, that makes total sense <laughs> That's now. That's right. <laughs> yeah, uh, absolutely. So is there uh, anywhere else to uh, – that's your main way to get a hold of you? Or is uh, – you got Facebook or anything like that? Or the main way to get a hold of me. Okay. I do a Facebook page that's sort of a cross-posting thing from my Hunter Software account on Instagram. But okay. honestly, like Instagram is pretty much where I'm living these days. Yeah, it's that's where I focus so, too. Yeah. I think there is a link to my email on there also, just in case anybody wants to, you know, DM me, ask questions, whatever. Like I'm perfectly happy to answer questions via email. I get a, I get a bunch of followers that are emailing me with cool articles that they find or you know if they've got questions about specific products and want something a little bit more in depth i'm more than happy to answer questions by like i said my whole thing is just sort of spreading that passion that i have for the outdoors and and getting people to to sort of get out there themselves and enabling people to do it in the safest and you know most enjoyable way so very very cool gosh well um man uh, this, awesome. this is some great stories. <laughs> no doubt. Some great we'll stuff. To, we're going to definitely have you on the show again for sure. Oh, thank you. Nice. It's been really nice chatting with you guys. Yeah, well, thanks for your time. I, I know uh, we all have some extra time right now that we've. <laughs> 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 I know we're all at our day jobs going, man, I wish I had more time to do stuff. And now we got time to do stuff. And it's like, oh, crap. Can't, can't do anything. It. <laughs> and it can't go anywhere. Anyway, I but, know, and fuel prices are so low. Damn. I know, right. there's there's so many things. It's like me, I'm an avid skier, and we're getting snow up in the Sierras oh, yeah. as we speak. Oh, and yeah, you're looking at like two more feet in uh, the mountains right yeah, now. Yeah, thanks, rub it in. And yeah. uh, you can't ski it unless you're backcountry skier. So yeah. um, I do have a snowmobile, and I've been tempted to go up there, but you know, we're trying to respect this shelter-in-place thing and... Stay yeah. safe. And Stay so safe forth. and, yeah, all that. So, cool. But thank God for wine and whiskey. Heck yeah. All right. 
<laughs> and on that note, Christina, thank you so much thank for your you time. Thank you so much, Christina. And uh, look forward to your future travels and following you on the gram there at uh, Huntress Off-Road. Awesome. Right. Chat with you again soon. Then. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, there you go. How about that? The Huntress. Would you load up your Jeep with a rooftop tent and go just start driving? No, I don't know about my Jeep, but I would definitely load up my truck and camper and start driving. <laughs> I got to have my queen size bed. But, yeah, uh, <laughs> you, you, you've been spoiled. That's the problem. See, you're home away from home. I, I know I'm the same way, but I mean that. How cool is that? I mean, getting to see uh, all those different areas, remote areas. Oh, my God. She had a she had a great adventure. And, uh, you know, I mean, that's. That's ballsy to head out into those areas, you know, by yourself, a woman. Yep, yep. yep. Uh, very capable, though. Uh, she can protect herself, and uh, fortunately, she didn't have to. But, uh, nope. uh, you know, but in, in getting to see and meet some really cool people along the way. Well, and that's, that's kind of the best part of the story, I think. I mean, the scenery being out and about. Uh, you know, seeing, you know, the Black Hills or, or the Grand Tetons and, you know, down in New Mexico and the Grand Canyon. Having the rave in the Grand the, Canyon. The rave. See, that's what I'm talking about. The people that... <laughs> call it a rave. You know, we hear... We, we, the the news loves to talk about the bad, you know, the good, the, the, the bad, the ugly. The news. And, but there's so much good out there. There's so much, so many great stories. And to hear about her, you know, being brought in by that family up in Montana and the, the, the rave party basically down out the water on the Colorado River with the, with the rafters. That's that's really it's, cool stuff, you know. It's inspirational. Absolutely, it makes you think. It makes, makes me think, think that the world's not as bad as we think it is. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, anyways, hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, shoot us a a message here. Love to hear from you. You can hit up uh, Chris at wheelingwineandwhiskey dot com or Jason at wheelingwineandwhiskey dot com. And uh, let us know. You know, we've been doing a, a few interviews lately. Uh, uh, just, you want to keep hearing some interviews? You want to just hear us ramble? You want to want to hear from Lorenzo? What do you you know? What are you looking for? Well, Lorenzo doesn't talk much. <laughs> no, he really doesn't. He drinks a lot. He <laughs> drinks a lot. He's uh, yeah. This this isolation thing hasn't been good for him. <laughs> well, you keep the wine cellar locked, right? I have, but he he knows where the keys are. Oh, That's boy. a problem. I gotta hide him again. I gotta find a new spot. I'm gonna put him in a cage. But uh, anyways, um, what else? Uh, uh, merchandise. Oh yeah, let's. Do, I mean, we some do. wheeling wine and whiskey merch. Yeah, it's looking good. It's, it's up on the um, the World Wide Web. There, it's on our web page. Yes, it is. Uh, so you can go to wheelingwineandwhiskey.com. dot com. Uh, of course, you can you can point people in that direction, your friends, if uh, you want to tell them about our podcast, and they can hit their favorite podcasting platform there. Yep. Um, they can uh, fall in love with the podcast and say, hey, I want a shirt. I want a hat. That's right. Hoodie. Hoodie. Beanie. Beanie. Stickers. It's a couple stickers. I don't know. So, um, yeah, the link's there. Um, it's through our buddy, John, at Dirtbag Clothing. So you can go to dirtbag.com and uh, go to the main page, and then you'll see uh, just at the top uh, bar there, menu bar, is uh, Wheeling Wine and Whiskey. Mm -hmm. Click on that, and that'll take you right to our merch. And so Johnny's uh, helping us out with all that. Um, super cool. Big shout out to Dirtbag so, Clothing. So, yeah, thank you, John, and Dirtbag Clothing for, uh, for helping us out once again. And... Um, yeah, I, I failed to mention at the last episode that that includes, uh, I think, shipping. Shipping's included uh, anything over 25 bucks. Uh, something like that, yeah. So that's a pretty good deal. It's a hell of a deal. You know? And we kept thinking, we're, we're, you know, we'll make a little bit of money off this thing, but we're definitely not going to be able to quit our day jobs, but to help, uh, uh, you know, fund the podcast here a little bit. And uh, quality stuff. This is not cheap ass uh, shirt that you no. wash once and you're never going to be able to wear again. So hey, uh, fill up the fill up the jet. <laughs> yeah, spool up the jet. We're heading heading to Vegas. <laughs> I would love to be able to say that honestly someday. I've said that a bunch of times at bars. Call the captain. Where, get the jet warmed up. Yeah, I've never been able to honestly say that. <laughs> and. <laughs> 
Yeah, <laughs> we're, we, we're not, uh, we're, we're just trying to cover our cost here and, uh, um, you know, provide, we've had a lot of people request merchandise and there we got, have. got a cool logo. Uh, we, we damn near sold out of stuff at the KOH That's right. just, just from word of mouth there That's at right. our camp. So that was cool. Um, so anyways, uh, and, uh, hit us up on the gram. Yep. Wheeling wine and whiskey. So appreciate you listening. Hope you're enjoying it. Hope you're staying safe. Yes, yeah. Stay safe is key. Hope uh, Lorenzo doesn't know where the key is to your wine cellar. And with that, I got nothing else. I don't either. All right. We're out. <laughs> <laughs>